Welcome. Welcome. I'd like to start this next portion of our meeting. So we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains and pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present and future while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Okay, welcome. So I'd like to look for an approval of the agenda. Craig? I'd like to... Uh, add some things and delete some things to the agenda. Okay. Uh, I would like 6.7 to be put into an action item. And I would like uh, 8.9 to be deleted from the uh, agenda. Yes. And 8.9 to be deleted. Okay. So you'd like a 6.7 to be moved under section eight then? Yes. So should we put that as a new 8.9? Yeah, I moved that to new 8.9. Okay, so that'll be 8.9. And then the current 8.9, Bill 15, you're le looking to remove? Remove it from okay. the agenda. Okay. And uh, with those changes, I would like to approve the agenda. Mo move to approve the agenda. As, as, as amended. amended. Okay. So any discussion or additional changes? Seeing none, those in favor? <coughs> and that's carried. And then I'm looking for an approval of the minutes. So the minutes are there. Are there any errors or omissions? Seeing none, can I get somebody to move those? Christina, all in favor? And those are carried. There's no business arising from the minute, so we'll move right into our business and operations associate superintendent report. Christine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the report, of course, is in the um, the agenda package, but I want to highlight a couple things from that report. Um, first of all, we held our Galbraith um, Elementary Visioning Workshop uh, May 11th and 12th, and uh, it was an awesome two days. Um, we had um, some teachers from the school and we had the administration, we had um, the trustee, uh, Christine Light from the uh, facilities committee, Allison um, was able to drop in for a little while. There was Cheryl, um, myself, Daniel Heaton, and then um, our consultants, Group 2 Architecture. And what Group 2 Architecture did is they led a workshop to have the people in the room to look at what, you know, what was it we like about this beloved 1912 school and 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 pay you know honor to the the heritage of the school and and what could the spaces look like in a modernization and um, it was a, a great engaging day the pictures you see people are engaged in in reimagining spaces within the 1912 school as well as the addition that was from 1963 and um, a great day great Great information for Group 2. Group 2 is now going to create a, um, a report uh, that will talk about um, what, um, the, mo the need for the modernization, um, the, um, what we could do in a modernization. There's also estimated costs for an, a modernization. And then we will submit that to Alberta Education as part of our, uh, as a supplement to our capital plan to make our case to get funded for the modernization. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a great day. We even had a heritage architect there that talked about the value of the heritage piece of, of the 1912 building. Because when we look at, at value, because of course, value for money, uh, when you're comparing, um, you know, whether you modernize a school or maybe replace a school, um, it's not just cost, but it's the overall value and the value to the community. And definitely the 1912 building has a lot of value to the rich history of uh, the Galbraith neighborhood and to our school division. So, so it was a great, it was a great session. Um, next under finance, of course, we had the presentation of the budget last week. Um, and then tomorrow at 3.30, um, the board will uh, review uh, each section of the budget and vote on it, uh, vote on the budget or to amend the budget and then at the end of the day pass a budget that is required to be submitted to Alberta Education by May 31st and that is under the School Act, that requirement unless waived by the Minister. And um, yeah, another picture in there. We're really excited. We finally got all the furniture that we ordered last year. 
um, from money that we received from uh, winding up the school business school bus operation with the city. We put it into, of course, shop equipment and to uh, furniture, replacing a lot of the furniture in some of our schools, particularly furniture that was 20 plus years old. And due to supply chain, it didn't come in until January, and then we had to store it. Um, because that number of desks, we didn't have any place to put them, and they have to be, of course, move out the old and move in the in new, and that was finally done over the, the February break and the Easter break, and so there's a picture of uh, some kids at Emmanuel Christian Elementary School using their new desks, so we're excited for that. And technology, really excited to um, highlight the um, couple things here. First of all, um, our new eSport team at LCI, the Samurais, um, who've been doing a lot of great work there and uh, just taking up the, taking True North eSports League by storm, which is exciting. And then there's going to be an eSports open house on June 3rd at LCI from 1 p.m. to 5. And so an opportunity for people to see the new eSports arena, staff and students, uh, community are all invited, trustees. Um, and then you can see what this looks like, eSports and, and what they can do with the eSports arena. So we're kind of excited for that. And then another item that Ed4769 started at the University of Lethbridge. And uh, this is a course that was co-designed in partnership between the University of Lethbridge and our school division. And what it does is it helps helps create 360 VR contact content for our K-5 schools. So that's virtual reality where kids can actually go and experience places like Drumheller in their, in their VR glasses. They can experience dinosaurs and things like that at the Terrell Museum. Um, and so there's a number of elementary teachers within our division that are going to help support with the class. And uh, currently they had 20 students enrolled. So I believe that started last week. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. And let's see, it was school bus driver appreciation um, at the uh, beginning of the month. And so um, our school division and, and Holy Spirit School Division um, supported creating some little goodies um, that went out to our bus drivers and we had a cake and then Southland had a big appreciation barbecue and, and uh, the uh, drivers were very appreciative of um, the, the support that they get. And then other than that, that's kind of the, the, the main highlights. Other than I did go, and Jenny was there too, the Dr. Robert Plaxton Spring event. And I pulled up uh, to go to the event. That was just last week. And there was not a parking spot to be had. And I had to squeeze between a truck and a van on the street. I had to put my parallel uh, parking skills to work. Thank goodness for backup cameras is all I can say. And uh, squeezed in. And it was just packed and but what a performance it was absolutely fantastic so um it's always good to see the, the student performances that's it if there's Craig. Any yes uh it's kind of fun to see the things happening in uh, technology my my one question is how well are we protected against viruses when they do this esport thing and because that involves quite a bit of stuff and a lot of technology. Are, are we pretty well protected against viruses and all of this stuff that we're bringing in? Well, I have to tell you, I'm very proud of our technology team. They, we uh, were part of um, a group in um, our insurance group that looks at, is an IT committee that looks at cyber risks and the things that we need to have in place. And our, our I, I'd have to say our IT team probably talks about those risks and security uh, concerns um, probably daily, if not weekly, like it's a, it's, it's a constant uh, watch. They do not put anything in unless they've done their, their due diligence. I can't tell you what they did, but they've got lots of, lots of controls in place. Now, there's no such thing as 100% controls because um, there's always something new on the horizon, but they do keep up with it. And um, we, they're spending some money as recommended by a, a consultant that they call it an endpoint uh, an endpoint. Uh, I think it was analyzer or something like that that uh, that helps also with some of our uh, software that we run. So they're uh, they're always on on top of that. Okay, thanks. And the second question is, do we as trustees get to go to one of these K to five schools with the students and do the VR? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's it's an ed, ed it's education ed forty seven sixty nine course so. But if you want to see it, they have them at Plaxton, and I'm, they'd be more than happy to uh, show you how to, how they work. Thanks, Christine. 
Jenny. Um, I just had a question. I was reading your technology report, and the one question I had was, I was just curious what we do with our old technology as we're updating. Our, our old machines? Yeah. So our old machines, if uh, they, first of all, they scrub them. Um, they get they get scrubbed to make sure there's no, no data on them, on the hard drives and whatnot. Uh, some of it, they used to have computers for schools where if you had some technology that was still had some life in that you could donate it to that. Um, the rest goes into recycling because by the time we, we actually turn them out there, because of the way software evolves and everything, they're pretty much not, not worth it anyways. Christine. I also have a technology question. I know the Ed4769 sounds like a really great class. So my question is, um, I know bef I think this is still how, how we function it. We have a traveling VR system. Am I correct in that in our division? Okay, so is there a conversation or a plan to increase VR capacity in our schools so that it's not a shared piece of technology, but that each school is able to house that? Has that been a conversation yet, or where does that sit? No, I have not been part of those conversations yet on what the cost would look like to make sure, for instance, every school had VR technology. No, I know we were very fortunate that Lenovo partnered in with Plaxton because we are actually piloting this this VR technology, and so we were, were, were given a really nice deal. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Craig. Just a follow up to Jenny's question. Like you did say that these computers, when you finish with them, they're use, basically useless, but would they be suitable for some of the children that are in our schools that can't get access to a computer to give them that to use? Uh, or is they just so far out of date that they couldn't use them? It would, de it would depend on the machine. Yeah, I would, I, that was sort of beyond my expertise. I would have to talk to our technology department to see if there's any ability to support. Part of the problem is with the old technology then, if you're running it with, it won't run with new software and it also, also the bandwidth that people would have. So it might be a little bit difficult to give them to a family that might have trouble supporting the infrastructure required to run them. So. But is that something that we could look at as a... As oh, I could, I could, yeah, I'll, I'll consult with the technology department. Okay. They'll, know, they'll know best on what can be used where and when. Okay, thank yeah. you. Might as well keep going with a tech question. Mine's simple, though. Um, you have, on average, 3,862 personal devices connect to our guest Wi-Fi. I think I know the answer, but is that, on average, daily, monthly? That, that would be, that probably be daily. Daily, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is fabulous, right? Yeah. That oh, yeah. We have that much access. That's what I thought. We, we do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else for Christine? Thank you. Thanks for all the work your department's doing. And we'll move on to Mike with Human Resources. Thanks, Allison. Um, so as you can see from the report uh, on the first page, um, typical update that we provide just in terms of what we're doing currently to add people to the sub list, do contract changes, those sorts of things. Um, some other highlights, I know a number of you were able to attend the Edwin Parr Banquet and uh, what a fantastic opportunity to celebrate beginning teachers and man, are they enthusiastic and excited and uh, very, very talented. So the profession's in really good hands. And uh, Ashley, our, our division representative, did a wonderful job. So really nice night and just so nice to get together with people in person and see people that you haven't seen in a long time. So that was wonderful. Uh, on to the second page, which really is the bulk of what's going on right now in human resources. Um, so staffing process is underway um, for support staff. They've met with every single school. Um, gone through what are the needs of the school, um, what do we have to do in terms of staffing, and uh, then there's timelines for when positions will come open, those sorts of things. Uh, from teacher perspective, uh, first step was number of contract changes, so people getting extended in next year, getting continuing contracts, probationary contracts, that sort of thing. And uh, before we even started advertising, we did uh, 52 of those changes, so that certainly uh, kept us busy. Uh, then in round one, 
one, we advertised 18 teaching positions, and just in round one for those 18 positions had 660 plus applicants. So there was quite a number of uh, applicants there. And then uh, just recently we advertised our round two, which tended to be more of temporary positions. And uh, those are closing, I think this afternoon here. And uh, and then we'll just advertise positions as, uh, as, we, as needed. So um, <clears throat> certainly been keeping very busy. Um, administrators have been really busy trying to get uh, interviews done, go through all the candidates, uh, make sure that every resume gets, um, you know, appropriate attention, all those sorts of things. So depending on your school, some schools don't have a whole bunch of hiring that they need to do because they've, you know, all their positions are kind of stabilized and some schools have quite a bit of hiring that they need to do just depending on the configuration of the school. Um, so huge appreciation of the work that our administrators are doing. Uh, in terms of staff absences, just wanted to give you an update. And this this heading was, and I was looking forward to this day, it used to say COVID-19 update. And so I took out COVID-19 and put staff absence um, summary because I think you know, that's right now a little more appropriate uh, in terms of what we're addressing. It's still, the absences still relate back to COVID, but a, a positive trend that we've seen for the last few weeks, and fingers crossed that this continues, our illness slash COVID absences have been low. Um, they're in that four to five percent range, which is a pretty good number, and it's not anything that you go, whoa, we've got a whole bunch of illness out there. Not the there isn't cases and people aren't getting sick, but uh, but it's been good to see that number hasn't uh, hasn't been going up a huge amount, which is great. We'll keep monitoring the trend because, as we all know, things can change very quickly. But. It's nice to have a little bit of good news. Uh, interesting thing has happened, even though illness uh, hasn't been on the rise, the number of absences have been on the rise, the total number of absences. And the reason for that is a number of things. First of all, it's just the backlog from the pandemic. So, um, you know, this time last year, there wasn't a whole bunch of in-person conferences to go to for professional learning. Well, now there are. Um, last year, this time, there wasn't citywide track meets going on. Now there are, uh, you know, opportunities to collaborate between schools, a whole variety of things. Field trips are happening. This is always a busy year, uh, time of year, the boost assessments, all those sorts of things are occurring. So um, that's challenged us a little bit. We've done a pretty good job for the most part finding substitutes. Uh, last week wasn't a great week uh, and there was you know, there wasn't really one thing we can pinpoint it to. One day we had a whole bunch of PD, obviously on the Friday before the long weekend, people wanted to take some personal concerns time and get away maybe early for a long weekend, which is totally understandable. And there there really hasn't been a backlog of those types of absences as well. People haven't been able to take time off because they haven't been able to travel, that sort of thing. So um, overall, we're going to keep working on it. Hopefully we'll have a good week um, this week in terms of finding sub replacements and, and the numbers will be pretty good. And if we can continue on a, a lower trend of illnesses, that surely certainly would be appreciated. So that's it for me, unless there's questions. Craig. Uh, a couple of questions. So if a teacher's doing a field trip or involved with track and field, are they listed as absent or is it absent from the classroom or is it just because they're not absent, they're working? Yeah, so where it really shows up on this is the ability to fill the, the subs. Yeah, so no, they're not always marked absence, but sometimes we don't have a sub to replace them is the challenge. Yeah. And the second question, and we probably have been given this information, but as I was going through everything, I lost track of it. How many uh, teachers and EAs and, well, not only EAs, but support staff are retiring this year? Uh, last update I had was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20-ish. Could be a little bit more than that. I haven't looked lately, but yeah, it's in that ballpark. Okay, and that, that would include everybody, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. My guess is it's going to be 28, 27, but I can check before the end of the meeting and see if I can get you okay. that number. Yeah, well, I, many... I wrote, read all those, but I didn't count them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, there's, yeah, that might give us the number right there. We'll see how close I was. Should have put a sign saying count them. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Mike? Seeing none, thank you, Mike, for your report and for all the work that your department's doing. Thank you. Moving on to Cheryl for superintendent's report. First is the board priorities report. Okay, is there for your 
information as always. Just a few highlights. Uh, well, I have the eSports highlighted, and Christine has already talked about that because that is exciting. I really want to get over there and take a look at what that looks like. And just to highlight, uh, and certainly if you haven't made it to the Southern Alberta Art Gallery to take a look at the uh, annual Arts Alive and what Arts Alive and While in Schools, um, as well, thank you to uh, Kathy Nelson and Garrett who put the virtual um, installation together as well. And now, Garrett, we had some voting on prizes. Have we tallied that yet? All right, so the big announcement will be Wednesday in terms of the prize winners there. And, of course, if you're at the um, the gallery as well, the gallery installation grade 9 to 12 had some winners as well um, to be to be recognized. And I'll, I'll make sure that they're listed in the next board meeting um, celebrations, highlights. Uh, uh, the Career Exploration Days hosted by Lethbridge College are being really well attended by our students. And I thank Lethbridge College for putting those together. They're great days to for youth to explore some potential opportunities for career. And Christine mentioned the Ed 4769 Developing Media for Children. And so I'll skip down. Oh, I want to highlight as well. Um, thank you to Rhonda Oss, who's always thinking out of the box and uh, did an application to the University of Lethbridge for a paid spring summer internship for a third or fourth year human resource student. And so look forward to having a student come and work with Rhonda in terms of uh, some special projects. Uh, of course, new curriculum literacy has been huge. And so we had uh, our kindergarten grades one, two, and three teachers and administrators May 10th and 11th um, have some in-service opportunities uh, to take a look at the English language arts literature and the mathematics curriculum um, with a focus on um, concept uh, concept based learning and so embedding that type of thing and I there's been really positive feedback on those two days from staff um, the report back to me from administrators when I've talked to staff is that they left those sessions feeling really confident and not feeling like they had to do any work over the summer feeling confident as leaders today in their professional site-based professional learning days, our elementaries certainly will be spending some time on that as well. And so a um, huge bouquet to the individuals who put that on, Karen Ratsey, Bev Smith, and Michaela Demers. And more workshops there listed in literacy as well as numeracy. They're working, um, you know, trying to do, as Mike has mentioned, sort of a little bit of catch up on some professional learning and so forth. And uh, I'm going to go down to, I'm sort of skipping around, transition strategies, Leanne, if we scroll, there we go. Uh, and as I've mentioned, uh, last meeting schools have been transitioning to contexts that do not have the COVID mitigation restrictions that were in place over two years ago. I know that many of us have had the privilege of attending many school events. It's been really fun and exciting, you know, all the way from the Fleetwood open house to celebrate their birthday to uh, Dr. Robert Plaxton to a number of schools having different kinds of events that and lots coming up still right over the course of um, June many things and for the first time of course as we're transitioning away from restrictions some grade 12 graduations to celebrate in a person-to-person -person, more traditional context so that should be exciting. Just to note that the Division Minecraft Challenge is ending May 31st. I can hardly wait to see sort of the outcome of that. Early learning, families have been notified of their e-placements for the 2022-23 school year. And certainly that uh, department has been working hard um, to ensure that uh, there's been assessment that's been happening and families communicated with. Um, indigenous education, of course, that uh, the, the graduation, that comes up really quick. That's June 2nd. It was in Churchill High School, and that's who's hosting it. But, of course, it's honouring in our, high, our Indigenous high school graduates from across the school division. Uh, under the wellness, uh, the Anti-Racism, Anti-Oppression Committee uh, reviewed and has uh, produced a uh, policy draft um, to come before the board. Wellness grant final reports were due and we've been working on some wellness visioning in the division and that will be part of moving forward the health and wellness curriculum coming in the fall as well. Uh, there's some diversity pieces. I'm going to skip down to international programs, Leanne. Thank you. You know, I just had a chance to touch base with Trish today. I'm trying to remember where she was. 
was Whistler. And, uh, you know, she's, uh, my goodness, she's what I call sort of a rock star recruiter, right? Like she's, uh, we've already got um, 100 students for next year. Our challenge right now is finding home placements for them. And so certainly uh, for the first time ever, we've sort of put the pause button on. We've got to make sure that we've got places and spaces for international students. And so Lethbridge is becoming a really popular popular spot for sure and our schools do such a wonderful job and we're really fortunate to have that diversity in our schools and I know our schools really enjoy having international students come and brings a flavor of um, what the lens of some other cultures look like in our schools. Our second and final division wide PL day occurred on April 25th and we had some collaborative communities and uh, we also had some inclusive education training. April 27th was the third session of a four-part worksh workshop series um, offered by Bev Smith on Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol, SIOP, for learning support teachers. I, you know, I highlighted that because I want to point out uh, the, the, uh, the, the in-depth kind of professional learning that, um, that our teachers are, can offer other teachers. Um, that, are, that one is specialized for limited formal schooling programs, English language learning students who have limited formal schooling. And ah, nine caretakers, fifth class power engineering course, working their way through that from March to September. So that's exciting. And, and, uh, and I think there's a structure that Rhonda has set up and Christine to make sure that there's some mentoring and guidance and uh, to set those individuals up for success. And QP 2090 leadership training part two is today, was, was this morning, yeah. right? And so um, thank you to Ron and Christine again for taking um, the initiative to provide all of our staff with leadership opportunities. Uh, we've got Carmen Carvello, uh, who's currently teacher at Cobank, so will be starting as our new ESL lead teacher in the fall. I'm now at Collaborative Partnerships to Support Learning. There we go. Uh, Rochelle Neville attended the Lethbridge Plays Steering Committee. Now, I was asked to join a meeting there next week. I thought it was plays as in drama plays, but <laughs> it's about engaging children in play um, as part of brain development and healthy activity. And so certainly that's something that's been core to our early learning um, foundational um, perspective for a number of years. And I commend Rochelle for really taking a lead role on that steering committee. And Anne Muldoon, of course, uh, Represented, we had a meeting that night. Uh, the division had a conversation to discuss family medicine in Lethbridge, so she went to that. Uh, and of course, we've got the management of growth, the wrap up of the four million infrastructure and energy improvement project. So that's wrapped up, Christine, is my understanding. That was yet, yeah, and that's all done. And then other things that uh, Christine Lee has already talked about. So that's that's just questions. Craig. Yeah, on the international students, um, I was just kind of flipping through things, and I noticed that, uh, for example, Livingston Range has a really good video with parents talking about having students from another culture, and it's on their website plus their Facebook. Do we do something similar to get more people involved so that they are aware of the opportunities of having uh, international students in their house, and if not, are we thinking about getting a video and put it up on our website and our Facebook to help get more people? If we're going to get more students, we have to have more people to take care of them. So, um, so our Lethbridge School Division has a contract with Canada Homestay, it's called. And I know Trish just had a meeting with them last week and they're going to be putting some promotion strategies in place. And so Canada Homestay will be responsible for putting some promotional strategies in place, which may in fact be, of course, uh, pushed out through our website or through our international uh, website. Yeah, they, they, she met with them last week and uh, she indicated they've committed to finding those home places and that they'll put together some promotion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mike. Just very quickly, Craig, to your question earlier, I did text uh, Carrie and uh, she indicated that right now we have 25 retirees. So that's teachers and support staff, everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, if you want to, oh, go ahead, Jenny. Sorry, just under the wellness, um, there's a reference here to a grant 
that was due in May that was that is now shared. I wondered where that information is. So this is I'm announced. just going to read this. Sorry, Jenny, to make sure. So uh, the wellness grant is through the wellness committee, and so those uh, would have been shared with the with the school schools. Is your trustee on that wellness committee? Uh, I'm on that committee. Okay, so did you work through process of? Andrea's our chairperson on that committee. No, so they okay. would have went through and then awarded this. So each school would have submitted a proposal and then they would have received approval for those in the last month. Oh, I see. Okay, right. I'm putting the pieces together what, what this best? is. I see. This was not. This was an internal grant to yes. schools from the division. Yes. Yeah. That answers my if question. If that makes sense. Well -being grant that we're still waiting. Yeah, we're still. So yeah, okay. we're still waiting from that's, the province. That's what I was. Because it gets confusing. Wellness. Yeah, is a common term. So we're still. We still don't know what the province announced. We don't know the well-being grant. No, we don't. Okay. And it and it was the well-being and learning gap grant. So what that looks like, we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then my other is not a question, it's more of a comment. Just on this section here, transition strategies, I know that we've spoke to this and I know that this is a school-based thing, but I think it's worth noting that um, I'm not sure if other trustees are having the same experience. I do know we all received one email, but I've heard still several um, instances from parents of confusion about what is allowed and not allowed in elementary schools and um, I was as somebody shared an example where they had made an appointment with a teacher to come in at a certain time and and they let the office know that and the office staff felt uncomfortable and so they they escorted that parent there and and waited for them and and escorted them out again and 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 then that was able to lead to a conversation with with to just get on the same page and so that turned into a positive experience but um i guess my comment is to the fact that maybe there is still some level of communication at the school level with the elementary schools of helping parents understand what is happening within their schools and so i think that that communication would come from those schools directly but I think maybe we're recognizing still a little bit of a need for school-based communication in the elementary schools with parents. And Jenny, we also have that under 10.4. So yeah, if we can, I think some of us will have other comments as well at that point, if you're good with that. Okay, sounds good. And somebody online have a question? No, a ding, okay. Sounds good. Any other questions for Cheryl? Go ahead, Craig. Well, just a comment, um, and I'll do it now because you brought it up. I attended the afternoon event at uh, Lakeview and uh, heard the government from SAFDEC presentation. Um, and uh, as a trustee, I felt more or less comfortable that the K-3 to language arts and math is satisfactory it'll it'll work there are some little things but teachers are given a lot of leeway from what I from the presentation and in fact I think at the next ASBA meeting uh, the chair uh, the chair of Palliser would like to have that person come for one hour and uh, and and talk to the trustees I think it's valuable for trustees to hear that because as we know there's been a lot of comment about the thing but uh, and I was given the, the big sheets with the all of the requirements and that, and uh, thought, well, more or less, it, it's doable and it can it can work. And so, I just would pass that on that uh, all is not lost with the curriculum. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Next is donations and support. That's their for you Southland trailer donated a brand new flat flat deck trailer to OCI. And uh, that was huge because their previous flat deck trailer really needed replacing. And so uh, we're very fortunate, I've said this before, to have amazing community partners, businesses, 
um, industry that that support our schools. And and we Galbraith was successful in uh, getting eight thousand dollars from Community Foundation for um, creating an outdoor learning space. And so that um, was talked a little bit about at the Galbraith uh, planning session. Perfect. Any questions on those? Thank you to both those sponsors for those donations and acknowledgements of excellence. And so, of course, we've got uh, um, a list, a lengthy list of students that were uh, recognized uh, in terms of uh, the um, regional, yeah, that's all regional science fair and so certainly and other projects and so certainly uh, again those students if you if you're in that if you're in a liaison to that school if you're in that school you know that family I'm um, certainly providing those students with recognition means a means a lot to them Craig uh, I was just wondering when that took place the regional science fair oh that was Let's see, I would have given the um, the winners to put in here. That was about a month ago, Craig. I guess I, that would... And be I didn't get an invite either. And actually, I was surprised every year I do. Yeah. yeah, every year I get an invite, and this was the very first year I didn't get an invite. It, it would be nice, I guess, if we could send something back to them that trustees would even be interested in seeing that. Right, yeah. And yeah, I, will, I was going to let them know, because I don't know if someone new or different perhaps was organizing, because in the past... We've always had a received an invitation, yeah, actually an invitation to judge as well as an invitation to all trustees. So it might have just been, I'm thinking it was a miss. miss. I'm okay. sure it was an intentional thing. It was just a all miss. Right. And yeah, you bet. I'll, I'll make sure I do that. Can't say for sure, but I seem to remember getting something about the science fair, but it was like two months ago. Well, it would even be longer than two months ago that they would send an email then. But I seem to remember an email actually come through oh if you could check for that because yeah. I'd hate to write them if we if we did get something okay okay and the sh showcases there and then we've got some school showcases dr. Gerald Proby and you know they, they he sort of framed some of the showcase in the four C's of the school care creati creativity cooperation and uh, courage and I, I'm sure the parents are relieved because any of you who have been parents or were parents or are parents that do are part of playground fundraising is huge and extraneous. And so they're very proud to have uh, purchased four accessible play structures and, and to sort of put the playground uh, fundraising uh, on the go. They had, and what they did is sort of said, you know, even with COVID, we still did a lot of really great things for kids throughout the year, magic shows, winter carnival, virtual remembrance day. Um, and um, I really love to, to have read about the grade five leadership activity providing service. And I know a lot of our elementary schools um, with their leadership programs uh, have service uh, to the community as part of that piece. And uh, of course they talk a little bit, uh, can you believe it dance with on $16,000? <laughs> that's actually, that's amazing as well and I think that you know what you'll see common across school education plans which will be published at uh, the end of the month as well is the whole idea of building thinking classrooms as a free to frame uh, the work that we're doing in curriculum to frame that the work we're doing pedagogically in classroom uh, to frame what the work that we're doing in universal design for learning and make that an actuality and so that's mentioned there. Galbraith of course they had their March Madness and that's sort of a fun competition of um, different books and really promotes the love of reading. And then the books that get the top votes from the students, uh, each uh, they purchase uh, those books for the classrooms. And they had a World Wildlife Fund. Uh, they received a $1,000 grant there and um, the 8000 as mentioned, uh, for their outdoor space. And Christine Lee has already mentioned Galbraith uh, envisioning their possible modernization. LCI, there's a list of achievements there, you know, six provincial championships, three, uh, well, five of those in, in wrestling and one in the mixed curling provincial champions. 
and the Provincial One Night Festival in Red Deer's seven awards. That was recent. And it's what's exciting about this is knowing that our students get to participate in things again and be able to have those experiences. And they continue to grow. If you look at the bottom there, and, uh, you know, they've got, they'll be um, moving forward with some new programs, online welding and yoga. And if you take a look at their population, uh, they continue to grow and, and provide a great breadth of opportunities. And their graduation, June 28th at the NMAC Centre. Are there any questions? Not seeing any, so on to the e-learning update. Right, the, some of the board had requested what's happening with the e-learning. And so this current school year, the 2021-2022 school year, um, e-learning was approved as a pilot project. And so there was a modest amount of funding that came out of uh, board reserves that fell under special projects category of reserves and uh, sort of funded... Uh, as well as not entirely, but assisted the schools in delivering that. So we had e-learning this current school year uh, delivered from Dr. Robert Plaxton for the elementary program. Uh, we had Senator Joyce Fairbairn for the middle school program and LCI at the high school program. The goal of a pilot project is always to, um, you know, let it launch, see what happens and see what, uh, whether it becomes sustainable or not. And so it, uh, in some cases, it's sustainable, and in some cases, it's not. And so the sustainable piece means it's not needing any further board reserve money. That's what sustainable means, that it's supported by the amount of staffing that a school would get um, by their staffing allocations. And so with Dr. Robert Plaxton, uh, there was not enough grade one students to move forward with the grade one program e-learning. There is a grade combined grade two, three, and a combined grade four, five program at Dr. Robert Plaxton. So if we think about sustainability into the future, we can predict then, um, because there was only, I think maybe it was two or three uh, grade ones that expressed interest in an online e-learning program, that that will eventually phase out as the school tries to continue to meet the needs of the parents who had registered in the two, three, four, five. At Senator Joyce Fairbairn, there's only 25 students uh, next year interested in e-learning. They are making that work because at a middle school level, they can have some economy by integrating some of that instruction with other classroom instruction. For LCI, um, they had um, a small number. They had at grade nine level, a small number of students, right around 10 or 11. Those will be blended with the other grade nine delivery to make that sustainable as well. Um, high school had less than 15 students express interest in registering for e-learning, and so that's not sustainable, and LCI will not be offering e-learning moving into next year. The high school principals did meet and talk about, so what do we do with our students that desire or are in a circumstance that they need a different kind of delivery of learning? And so certainly all the schools talked about their ability to be flexible, especially under the umbrella of high school redesign. So we've got Victoria Park, who certainly can make things accessible to students um, should they have a period of time they need to be at home. Um, as well, we've got different ways that schools will transition students um, to different programs and do credit recovery and those kinds of things, as well as connect them um, if they want full-time um, distance learning programming. Victoria Park can do the hard copy of that and we would connect them with a provider if they needed e-learning. But a very small number, it seems that high school students will come back in full force, want to be in the schools. There is a handful, and we will still try to meet the needs of that handful of students in different ways. Any questions? I have a question in regards to, um, do we ever work together with other divisions to see if there would be a combined, like especially at that high school level? Well, high school does always, well, doesn't always. So there's there, we did already this year. So LCI, for example, couldn't offer all e-learning. And so students, high school students can access programs in different places. It's a very complex um, endeavor now because it's funding is body count. And when it was funding by course, that was very e seamless and easy to facilitate because you could have 
Um, if they took one course through a different school division, that different school division would get five credits, for example. Or if they took half and half, but now someone claims the body. And so there has to be agreements in place, and which we 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 certainly have an agreement across Zone 6 for our dual credit with the college, for example, and the university. In terms of sharing of students, probably we get more requests coming our way than with the, so Victoria Park, for example, has a lot of other, um, have students outside of our school division make those requests. Sounds good. Any other questions? Okay. And I do see that it's 3.30 and we have our 3.30 guests here. So um, if you guys would like to come over to the front-ish. Yeah, and I'll have Cheryl introduce the three of you. Um, for how is the cameras going to work, Garrett, to be able to see? Yeah, you need to turn the mic on, and then we're just going to figure out cameras. So we have two of our trustees that are joining us virtually. So we have Christina is out in Newfoundland joining us and then uh, Andrea is at home. So, and then when I see that we do also have some public joining us. So go ahead, Cheryl. Thank you. All right. First, let's start with having you introduce yourselves and your, and your, the role that you play. For sure. So thank you for my, so much for having us join you, uh, join you here today. Is it okay for the sound? All right. My name is Jessica Deacon Rogers. I work for the Helen Schuler Nature Center here in Lethbridge. Um, I want to give a brief overview of my background just to give some context as to why I was involved in the Think Outside programs. Uh, so I have a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Bachelor of Education. I worked at the Nature Center for 18 years and one of my primary areas of work has been in the design, development and implementation of outdoor curriculum based school programs. So that's part of why I've been involved in this particular program. And my name's Jenna Jewison. I'm the middle school Indigenous education teacher um, with the division, so working with all the middle schools. And we've partnered with Jessica, so she kind of brings her science part to the lessons, and then we bring in the Indigenous part to the lessons. And I'm Shawnee Big Bull. I'm teacher of Indigenous education as well. I've got the high school profile, and so yeah, we're just, we're team think outside. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and I, this team is, uh, is you know, you're going to be, you've been, this is your second time on the road show for presentations. You're amazing. And I know that our schools have really strongly embraced uh, the Think Outside. And it's a program that we've been, that you've been able to reignite with the uh, proto COVID protocols being, being lifted. And so as been mentioned, it's a partnership uh, between Lethbridge School Division, uh, led by our Indigenous Education team um, with Helen Schuler Nature Centre, and it's to promote from the outdoors and learning outdoors. And it was an exciting initiative started in 2019. And so here we are getting it reinvigorated. And the benefits um, supports teachers to feel comfortable taking students outside to learn and for teachers to see value in learning from the land. And so these find uh, teachers, educators model for our teachers and so that they be, can become comfortable with that. It supports teachers and students to be more active and active outside, enhancing their wellness and uh, the impact, positive impact on their mental health by engaging in outdoor activity. And it assists teachers with TQS5 and feeling more comfortable with embedding Indigenous ways of knowing into their teaching, which has also increased Indigenous presence in our everyday learning. And so I thank you so much for coming and sharing your program with the board. Welcome. So we wanted to start uh, just by looking very briefly of the Think Outside program. In the fall of 2020, uh, the pandemic had hit really hard. Uh, schools were having to change the way that they think about teaching. Um, and both the school division and the Nature Centre were receiving a lot of requests 
for professional learning opportunities, for lesson plans, and resources as well for teaching and learning outside. Uh, so we thought there would be a great opportunity to work together um, with Morag Asquith with the school division um, to work with the Indigenous educators and Nature Centre staff modeling what it looks like to teach outside in local schoolyards. So these are the three objectives that we have for this particular program. Uh, to support students and teachers learning outside year-round through cross-curricular land-based learning programs. So there's three like, really key pieces to this first objective. The outdoors year-round part is really, really important for the type of programming that we were developing. We want teachers to recognize that you can teach outside on days when it's not sunny and 20 degrees out, that you can teach outside in rain and snow, you can teach outside in November and March, and it's very viable and a great opportunity for students and teachers as well. Also, the cross-curricular piece is really important for this particular program. It focused primarily on the four core subjects, so science, social studies, language arts, and math. The eight lessons that we've created for grades six and seven incorporate these different subjects within the lessons. And then finally, the heart of the Think Outside program is place-based or land-based learning. Now, this type of learning really focuses on learning from a place rather than learning in a place, which is a different way of learning than what we're accustomed to. It really looks at having people outside, learning from that experience outdoors as well. Our second objective was to incorporate Blackfoot ways of knowing and Indigenous education through land-based learning. Blackfoot language and traditional ways of knowing are woven through each of the lessons that we created as well. And then finally, to develop resources and demonstrate methods for teaching and learning outside. One of the things that I've noticed working at the Nature Centre is that very few people in our community know very much about local animals and plants. They don't know a lot about local ecology. And so we really wanted to bring that local knowledge of this place to these lessons so that teachers have that resource and can learn to teach from the animals and plants in our ecosystems and knowledge, traditional knowledge that we have of this place. We also really wanted to focus on what it looks like to demonstrate teaching outside. Most teachers, when they're doing their education programs, aren't taught how to teach outside, and it is very different from teaching in a classroom. And so demonstrating some of those methods that are successful for teaching outside were really important for this program as well. We also wanted to focus on some of the benefits of being outdoors. I think COVID-19 has really brought to the forefront the importance of spending time outside for people of all ages. And this program, we really wanted to highlight what those benefits are for teachers and for students as well. So as we know, all know, spending time outside helps to reduce stress and anxiety. I know for myself, it makes a huge difference if I go outside. And it's still a very stressful time. We've moved on from 2020, um, but I think there's still a lot of stress and anxiety in students and teachers in school. It enhances academic achievement. So studies have found in the past five to 10 years that students that spend more time outside actually do better academically than students that spend less time outside. It helps to increase intention and concentration. For myself, it's very true. If I'm struggling with a project, I can't quite focus and need to kind of refocus and get, get things together, be able to think. I often will go outside for a short walk or have an outdoor meeting. And that short period of time outside can really help with that attention and concentration. It also really helps with creativity. So thinking of different kinds of ideas um, for students and teachers as well. Nature-based activities improve behavior and cooperation skills. So for students, they found that uh, behaviors are better when people have spent more time outside, when those kids have spent time outside doing a variety of activities. It increases our energy levels. I think we could all speak to this. I believe probably everyone in this room has had the opportunity to go outside for a walk and get that kind of energy boost when you've come back in. And then finally, it helps kids to develop independence as well. Recent studies have found that we're spending more time than ever indoors. A Canadian study was done in the past five years found that children are spending up to eight hours a day on a screen and less than an hour a day outside. So this is a really important time for us to be modeling what it looks like to spend time outside both at school and at home as well. We wanted to uh, demonstrate just what think of outside looks like. So all of these pictures are from schoolyards and some of the lessons that we taught. The upper left in the center are language arts lessons where students had to go find an object uh, in the schoolyard that was palm sized. They then took that object and had to write from different perspectives about the object. The upper right hand picture is a web of life program uh, that Jenna is stuck in the middle of. <laughs> uh, there's, the students have different species cards. So there's pictures of different animals and plants with the English and Blackfoot name on the card and a bit of information about them on the back. The bottom right is an example of one of our sensory or mindfulness activities. We incorporated into both grade six and seven lessons. Uh, this one, the students were asked to go find a space in the schoolyard that was at least two meters from other students. 
and they were in instructed to stand with their eyes closed and listen for a period of time and count the number of different natural sounds that they heard in their environment. And then finally, the bottom left is an example of a math lesson. The students are creating uh, sticks and marking the most specific patterns. In the past, it would have been bones. It's called the bone game. This was one of my favorite activities. The students really, really love creating the activity materials and then being able to play the game. Uh, the day after this photo was taken, we had one of the teachers from the school email us and let us know that the kids that were in grade seven had actually been taking and making bone games out of pieces that they found around school and then playing the games uh, in the hallways and then after school at after school activities as well. She also was really excited about the opportunity to teach statistics and probability in a different way in her classroom. Okay, so um, to look at our overview from 2020 and 2021, um, we, we started in the fall of 2020 um, and we worked with grade six and seven classes from three middle schools. Uh, we were able to deliver one lesson to each of the classes, but we had to stop delivering the program because of COVID. Um, and remember we said that we're, we're teaching in all kinds of weather and everything, right? Um, I was pregnant at the time, so even, you know, pregnant people modeling that, I was a lot larger and Jessica can attest to me waddling around doing the Think Outside program. Um, and then came 2021 and uh, we started back up the program again and we worked with 770 students from 26 grades, six and seven classes. And that's uh, just from Gilbert Patterson and Wilson. And we were able to deliver two lessons to each class uh, this fall, which I think we found that the continuity of being able to come back and do a second lesson was very beneficial. They, the second time we came back, they knew what we were doing, that we, why we were there, what we were there for. Um, and so it, it seemed to, to hold, it seemed to stick. And so um, teaching in every, every kind of weather as well, the two pictures up there, that's from the same day, the same morning. When we got there, that's the first class that morning. And then by before noon, um, the snow had melted to the second picture there. And so in this particular lesson, and we were teaching, uh, we were doing the run and scream game. And um, it was so funny because the kids were using the snow to their advantage, right? And in part of this lesson, we try to teach um, with math and how from an Indigenous perspective, math is a verb, math is action, right? And so as they're moving along, they're having to run and scream with one breath, they hold it and then you slowly scream as you run and you see how far you can run, right? But with the snow and the slipperiness, they were able to slide. So whether it was contentious, whether or not the slide was, was that's where their mark was or was it when the slide started, right? So um, it was, it, it definitely fit into that whole idea that math is a verb and teaching that through the experiential part of it. Um, so here we are, uh, spring 2020, 2022, and we worked with 36 grade six and seven classes. Uh, with a total of 1,067 students from all four middle schools. So that was big for us, for sure, to hit that many kids. Um, we were able to deliver two lessons to each of the classes once again. We spent a total of 124 hours outside um, this school year. So for us, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, that's about it for me. Those are just continuing on pictures of... Uh, of some of the different lessons. So yeah, all, all kinds of different weather we played and we, we were outside for. Okay. Yeah. And then, so one of our lessons was called Nature Poetry. I'm just gonna read this in case people can't see it. Um, it says, I am a rock or stone. No one knows how old I am or how I came into this world from when we had dinosaurs to wars to what's happening right now. I used to be a big grandfather rock, but over time I became small the humans think i have no value unless i am other colors but really i have more stories than you can count i have all the answers to your questions so this was written by a grade seven student at wilson and this was our grade seven nature poetry lesson so what happens in this lesson is the students find an object in nature that is interesting to them and first they describe it with four of their senses leaving taste out um, and then we talk about that. So how does it sound? I know and sounds silly, but grade sevens, almost every single class, at least one person shoved a pine cone in their mouth. <laughs> so, 
Um, but then talking, well, my object doesn't make a sound. Well, what if you tap it on your finger? What if you throw it against a tree? So just those different ways to use your senses in nature. Um, and then, so we shared uh, the different things about your objects. Then they went back and told a story or wrote a poem from the perspective of that object. So there we wove in the concept of animacy, which is really important to Indigenous cultures. So talking about, we respect everything in nature. We respect a rock just as much as we would respect a person um, and all that. So there was a lot we could weave into this lesson. And I really loved hearing um, the different kids' stories with this lesson. And this student, um, the teacher shared she wasn't usually very engaged in things, so it was really nice to see her. She was an Indigenous student, a Stony student. Um, and then she was wearing a medicine pouch, and even before the lesson started, I just commented on it, and she was really excited and showing me. She had rocks in it, was talk talking all about it and everything. So just showing how the students also, our Indigenous students, can see representation in these lessons and get them engaged in everything. And then moving forward, I have made kits for each middle school. So for the eight lessons, they have all the materials, the lesson plan, everything there. They can just grab it and go. Um, we've also let them know they can email me or Shawnee to come in and lead a lesson so that they can have it modeled. And then in the future, they can do it or they can even teach their grade level how to use it. Um, and then we want to create some, because these are just middle school lessons, but they're really, they're cross-curricular. They can be used across different grades. Shawnee and I are going, we did um, with our health champs meeting. After that, we did one of the traditional lessons, and we're going with 60 grade four students this week to do one of these lessons. So they're really versatile. So um, we're going to make kits for the elementary level and the high school level um, is what we're going to do so that these are available to every teacher year-round all the time. That doesn't have to be us going in. Um, and then we're hoping to pilot it in a few elementary schools next year at the grade four to five level. So we still have to meet and see how that would look because elementary is a bit different than middle school, but just trying to get as many grade levels as we can engaged with this program. Um, and yeah, like I was saying uh, too, like I know it's helped me learn how to teach outside today. Uh, Mel was doing a PL with Galbraith about traditional games and the man that was supposed to come couldn't show up. So we improvised and went on a nature walk and with one of our language art stories, we saw one of the bullberry bush and we had a noppy story to go with it. So I was able to tell the story and it's really helped weave into different situations, even with teachers that's helped us teach. So um, yeah, just really versatile and nice and it's nice because everyone has an entry point into nature. Nature is key to Indigenous culture. So this is something that everyone, no matter your background, no matter your race, everyone can come together and find some connection in these lessons. Anyone have any questions? Leanne, can you tell us if Andrea or Christina have any questions? Any questions? No. Go ahead, Christine. I just wanted to say I think this is a phenomenal program, and um, thank you for all that you do. And I'm sure Allison will say that on behalf of the board too. But I just, I think I love that you're creating the packets because you're right. You can't be in all places at all times, and I'm just really excited to see the capacity of our staff and school communities building in this area. I'm really excited to see that um, you're, you're touching into the elementary schools now and even just to hear just a couple of the stories of how kids are engaging. And it just, I think any opportunity to bring learning to life and, and touching a student in a way that makes learning exciting and in a new way and they can engage it um, in an innovative and creative space, I just... That excites me. So thank you for all that you do. Craig. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just one comment, and, and I think it's great what you're doing, but uh, maybe next year, uh, as a trustee, I'd really like to hear what the kids think and bring the kids, some of the kids into the classroom, into our board meeting and let them talk about it. Uh, the program's great. And it just seems that it brings a little more emphasis to us as trustees to see when kids are, are telling us about it too. And so thank you very much. And maybe that's something that you could plan on for next year. That's a good idea. 
Thank you. Um, so on behalf of the board, absolutely thank you for coming and presenting today. It's great to see collaboration and working together with um, Helen Schuler as well. Um, to see how many hours we're getting outside is absolutely amazing. And I'm happy to hear that you're looking at going into the elementary schools as well. So um, again, thank you for um, the work that you guys are doing and we look forward to hearing more as the next year comes. Thank you. So we do have some more guests here. So I think we'll move on to our international trip approval. So we have Chinook, I believe. <laughs> Perfect. So what I'm wondering is if we could just start before, if you're okay with giving us a couple of minutes, is that um, as a new board, uh, this is the first time that uh, a request has come forward to the board. So I've asked Christine Lee to kind of give us uh, as a board kind of what we need to be looking at while we're um, listening to you present so that yeah, we can uh, make that approval and what uh, risks we need to be making sure that we're aware of so that we're um, not just approving it because you've had a great presentation, but that we've actually uh, done our due diligence when we do that. So if you can bear with us just for a couple of moments. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, so as, it, as this is an international trip, we require it to come through a board approval um, because of course international trips have a, a higher level of due diligence that is required and to make sure that our, our students are not only getting an amazing educational opportunity, but they're also safe. And so um, any, any school that's applying, and this is high school, by the way, that can only go on international trips. Um, if they're applying for an international trip, they have to go through Moray Gasquist's office and they have to file um, quite, a, quite a lengthy bit of paperwork to talk uh, about supervision, uh, the required supervision what the itinerary looks like, demonstrate the educational value, of course, of the of the, the trip that they're going on. Um, there's a number of measures that schools have to put in place, such as what are the contingencies plans if you're over there, if you have to send a kid home for misbehaving or for illness, um, what happens if there's a, an event that occurs when you're on uh, foreign soil and that sort of thing. And so a number of things. So those are the kind of things that we, we want to know that are in place. Uh, when we're looking at the trip and also we also look at are you using a reputable for instance travel provider in this case it's EF tours which we are you know fairly comfortable with over the years um, in in and uh, and how we deal with them so um, one of the things that I would ask is um, what is your plan uh, you know getting closer to the date to make sure that the place that the, your um, destination is still considered safe um, given things change quickly, so. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions for Christine before we move on? No? Okay, so please go ahead and provide us with your information. We're happy to have this as our first one. I was kind of wondering if this would be the first one in a couple of years, hey? Yeah, okay. It's okay, I'll be the project, that's all right. Um, okay, so the trip is going to be 12 days, including travel. So we are gonna take off from the Calgary airport and we're gonna fly into London. We're going to spend a few days in London before heading out into West Belgium and then over into much of northern France, but primarily the Normandy region where we'll hit up some um, World War I, World War II battle sites in Dieppe and Aramanche, and we'll go to the Juneau Beach Centre, the Omaha Beach Centre. We're going to go see a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the uh, Mont Saint-Michel, which is a little bit of a drive, but um, before ending into Paris with the last couple days. So it's 12 days altogether. Um, primarily in rural northern France and rural West Belgium with uh, two days in London and, and Paris, obviously. But um, That's the trip. The cost of the trip, if you're curious about the cost, is going to be about 4300 bucks. And then we did build in some um, what's traditionally optional insurance. We kind of made it more of a mandatory insurance and built that into the price. This includes some kickback for financial reasons in case something were to happen regarding the trip. Um, so if the students don't want to partake in that $199 optional insurance and they have to go about it themselves to opt out. So we made that part of it to try to give us even another kind of, I don't know, buffer, I guess, if you want to call it from some sort of unforeseen cancellation. Um, in terms of transportation, we are going to, as a group, uh, hopefully 
attending today. We are going to organize a trip from Lethbridge to Calgary, it, it, probably in a charter bus, uh, for which we'll be just doing some fundraising for that. From there, uh, we'll be flying based on how EF Tours has us. So airlines, hotels, busing, transportation. We're going to take the train from London into Calais, northern France. And so this will all be EF Tours organizing this stuff alongside a everyday tour guide. Sounds good. What questions do we have? Give them the tough ones. <laughs> Craig. I would just say that uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're looking at having uh, tours again. I think it's important as a teacher, I went on uh, a couple, mm -hmm. mainly rugby tours, but uh, still mm -hmm. the students learn things and uh, appreciate culture a lot better when they're there and they see things. And so uh, I'm kind of excited about this because I think one of the places you're going is actually Canadian. Uh, one of the monuments is actually a piece of Canada in France, isn't it? In Vimy, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So no, I'm I'm excited, and if the insurance and the, and I know the firm is pretty reputable, and if the insurance is covered and and un, no one's seen for it happens, that uh, I I'm I think it's great. Yeah, just just as a comment, I know that this year's trip is um, it, it's kind of trekking in uncharted waters given everything that's happened in the last two and a half years and I understand that um, you know you kind of want to have a, a few more things in, in line and I understand that I think that EF Tours has put a lot of things in place as a business I think that they wouldn't be able to operate if they didn't have them in place and so um, what I tried to reiterate to the students in our meeting that we had just to kind of generate interest or see what kind of interest we had was just to, to let them know that you know there are risks. There are, of course, there are risks, and there were risks in 2016 when I took a tour, and 2014 and 2012. Now they've evolved and they've changed for sure. Um, but that, you know, as long as we understand that those are on the table and that we take a few more precautions just in case things change, um, that obviously it's them still agreeing to those terms. I guess moving forward. So um, I think that the EF tours, uh, as a company, have done a pretty decent job, from what I can tell, in terms of prepping for some unforeseen. Thank you. I have Christina and then Jenny. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely for sure. So what we do is we open up registration from whatever the, you know, day one would be. Kids would register um, and then you're going to have a mix of kids. You're going to have kids who are going to be paying their own way through work on a monthly basis. You're going to have kids who whose parents are going to front that money up front and then they're going to work to pay off their parents. You're going to have uh, kind of a payments in chunks. You're going to have up front. It is kind of up to the kids, at least initially. We do offer the grocery coupons, but we are also as a group, if today goes well, we're gonna as a group sit together and, and talk about how we can mitigate some costs as a group as well, especially things like transportation from Lethbridge to Calgary. How can we get that, um, put that off the parents' responsibility, I guess if you wanna call it, and, and make that as a group thing. So I am going to approach the Legion. We did approach the Legion in 2014 when we did, did this trip and they were actually going to sponsor us uh, um, they got us some jackets and a few things as well. So I'm, I'm going to approach them. We did actually already buy them, and whether we go or not, this is going to happen. We, we already bought a brick at the Juneau Beach Center. Um, and so part of my Military History 9 class, we raised the money as a group through fundraising, and we, uh, we were going to present that when we go to the Juneau Beach Center as well, kind of give them a card and take a picture by the brick and so on. But um, outside of them paying their own way, we're going to talk about it as a group is the best I can tell you. Jenny. Um, your estimated cost, do you have a certain minimum number of students you need in attendance to meet that cost? Uh, 30. Minimum of 30. And it's in a, the past, how many did you have attend? 30. Ooh, we, uh, cut it tight. Okay, can I follow up with one more question? Sure, yeah. Well, how does the funding for the teachers and supervisors attending, how does that work? So EF Tours uh, promotes it as a six to one. For every six paying uh, travelers, there's one free spot. Um, and so 30 would give us um, four and a, 
I, I don't know how it works with the lead person. I think the lead person might be different, but we get four free chaperones as it currently stands. Five, I think, maybe actually. Yeah. Well, I, I just can't tell if 30 is with me or without me. That's the only problem. But if it's 30, then it's five free ones. Yes. So we will have a six to one ratio, I guess, is the best way I can summarize it. You're good. Are those all teachers? Like they if parents come, they pay for themselves, is that right? So in the past, I'm kind of following the rule book from the previous three tours we've gone on, and we have not had parents come. Um, we want to, be, to kind of create a pod system. So we're going to have six chaperones, and those six chaperones are going to be in charge of six kids. And so when we're coming to and from locations or we're getting ready to go for the day from the hotel, uh, we'll get into our pods, we'll do kind of a roll call, we'll make sure all the chaperones are good and where they need to be, and then we'll kind of proceed from there. So that has worked pretty well in the past, so that's kind of what I've stuck with. Thank you, Christine. And, and just for the trustees information too, the school division carries blanket student travel insurance as well. Um, and when we hit the pandemic last time and we had to curse cancel a whole bunch of, of uh, trips um, through some of the providers, so where they had insurance and the student blanket insurance we had, nobody was out of pocket. In some cases you got school, they got vouchers instead of cash, but um, but they got something back for what they paid. So so that was a good thing. So we still have that in place um, and that, that continues. And EF Tours was one of the better people to work with when we were dealing with uh, all that mess. So they are a good company to work with. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, if I could use a previous example, maybe as, um, I don't know, as my path forward. I, I'm Mike Mindio, I know, traveled with us in 2014, and he talked about how his three kids all went on trips using grocery coupons um, and that fundraising method. Um, though the process has changed since 2014, um, we have been in discussion with Katrina at our school, as well as, um, actually, Katrina and someone, I don't know. Um, but we've We've worked it so that anybody can buy those grocery coupons. So using Mike's example, he had not only his family, but other families buy grocery coupons and say, can I contribute that to um, Mike's family or whoever's traveling on behalf of Mike Mindio? So um, as far as I understand, that is still an option. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Jenny. Um, has this, have we ever collaborated between our high schools? for these trips or are they always individually done school by school? Uh, I don't know. I do know that. Um... Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you for your presentation today. And I think it is great to be able to offer this opportunity to our students and get them out into the world, especially since they haven't been going anywhere the last few years. So um, we are looking for a motion. Craig. I move that uh, the Chinook High School trip to Northern France, Western Belgium and London during Easter break of April 23. 23 be approved by the board on the condition that all division policies and procedures are strictly followed. Excellent. Any further conversation? And those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much and enjoy your trip. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So next, I'll call up Trish. She's cautiously walking. Yes, it's very hot in here. Okay. 
trying to make it uncomfortable for everyone. <laughs> I know. I feel like I'm on the hot seat here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So actually, before we get started, can I just point out in the action items policy 606 point, oh, no, not that one, sorry, policy 606.4 institutional schools, that has not, that's out with the stakeholders right now, so that is not coming to this meeting today. So 606.4? No, yeah. we don't have that on our list. Is it not on the list? Perfect. It's not on our list. Okay. Good. You're good. I'm good. Um, I'll also, would it be okay if we started with the anti-racism, anti-oppression policy first? Because yeah. we have two guests with us. You bet. Uh, so we have Tracy Wong, principal of Winston Churchill High School, and Kaylee King, principal of Victoria Park High School and Alternative Programs. Both are on our anti-racism, anti-oppression um, committee for the school division. So if there's any questions about this policy uh, to come forward, I would ask that you direct those questions to our two um, uh, presenters over there. So the first one is policy 103.1, anti-racism and anti-oppression. This let's is- Let's give them a, let's move them up to the front. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, this is a new policy and the yeah. first reading. Hello, everyone. Leanne's describing another mic because they can't hear you online if you don't have your mic going. Oh, sorry, Mike. That was you. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to talk in the mic. Sorry, thanks for your patience, everyone. We figure out the mics. <laughs> We're good. Okay, go ahead, Trish. Okay, so uh, any questions at all about this uh, policy for the first reading, brand new policy? So we do have some questions. Who would like to start? Tyler, go ahead. Hi, thanks for coming, by the way. So this will really help, I think. So my understanding is when this policy, you were drafting it and having conversation or whatever, in the second paragraph, uh, would that be, I guess, second sentence, where the part where it says, and is rooted in historical oppression, white supremacy and colonialism, that there was some discussion in regard to that back and forth and some uh, parent input. So I was just wondering if you could maybe um, bring us forward kind of what was discussed about that because I heard there were some people wanting it in, some people wanting it out, and just kind of what was discussed at the committee level in regard to that. You bet. I mean, I think keeping in mind that we have discussion about everything, we kind of labored over every single word that went into this policy. And so it wasn't so much an idea of what should be kept out and what should be included as much as a desire to represent the different root causes of where we are today with regard to our systemic oppression and what we're seeing in our in our systems, in our schools, in our in our families, in our homes. Um, where does all of that come from? And when we look at dividing out um, historical oppression, white supremacy and colonialism, there wasn't enough overlap to get rid of one versus another because each of them represents a different type of oppression that has occurred throughout history. And so much of it, we started with a longer list and we pared it down to these ones, but that is essentially where our conversation went. Uh, we looked at taking out each of the different terms of those three specific terms and found that in taking it out, we were lacking in our in our historical experience. 
And so if we take out um, white supremacy and we leave in colonialism, we're looking at colonialism being something that's driven by uh, an increase in, in a gathering of land or wealth or power over a certain um, country, for example. If we look at white supremacy, we're looking at a specific driver that has to do with white uh, with white superiority. And so there's a different driver for white supremacy than there is for colonialism than there is for, and they, they have both led to our historical ex oppression. So there wasn't, we couldn't take one out without removing a significant part of our history that we have to acknowledge has been part of what's gotten us to where we are today. That's where our discussion went. The other thing that we talked about is being um, accurate, like using um, terms and text that is accurate lo while looking at um, anti-racism practices across right now across um, our world. And so it was really important to us that we use accurate terminology that reflect where we're at right now as a society. And so when we talked about what do we include, it was really important for us to look at um, literature and research to ensure that the terms that we use are actually accurate and reflect um, a policy that our division wants to stand behind because it, it does need to reflect what is currently researched. And so that was important to our group. Okay, that's good. And so as a board, this is a pretty important policy, I think. I think that we would, I don't know, whatever, we'll, we'll get to the discussion, but I do believe that as a board, we feel this is a pretty important policy to get right. So we want to make sure we're, we're kind of really looking at this one and everyone, every stakeholder has their input as to uh, how this should go. So I know also that there are some other um, divisions that already have policies similar to this, and they've gone with a, a bit of an approach in defining different um, terminology in there, and we have not. And that one, I, I, I think maybe you had some discussion about that as well, so I'd like to hear what the discussion on that was, just because in my mind, when, when the school division talks about white supremacy in the context of this policy, it might mean one thing, but to the average general citizen, um, within our division or within our city, it might mean something completely different. So I'm I'm struggling a bit with with that and terminology that goes there. So I agree. I think people read terminology and attach meaning and emotional attachment to, to different phrases, and we want to look at actually what does that mean? What's the What's the true meaning of that? So we talked at length about having uh, definitions, which we want to include in the procedures. That's very, very important to us. So, but the one thing that we talked about, well, not one, but one of the things we talked about is the ability to update terminology as language changes. And so when it's in a uh, procedures, we can look at that um, more regularly compared to changing wording in a policy. So I capture that, Katie. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add to that would be that uh, when we were looking at our SOGI policy and developing that, we chose to keep our language and keep our procedures um, and all of the definitions that we were using separate from the policy itself so that we could update it. And now a couple of years later, we're finding that we need to very much change some of the language that's used in there. And we've even skipped over stages where we should have been attending to it on a more regular basis. So we're certainly not opposed to including the definitions. We were working to try and keep within um, the pattern or the way that, that previous policies have been designed. And we haven't traditionally included definitions within the policy. We've kept them in the procedures or in the appendix section. And so that's where we propose that we would put it this time, but we are absolutely not opposed to um, having definitions. We think it's, it's essential that we have definitions. Craig, is that your hands on? Okay, go ahead and then Craig. Um, my question is to, and I'm not very familiar with the process of, of your committee, so I apologize if there's ignorance in my question, but my question is to, do you feel like you have experienced success in receiving input from shareholders or had the ability to receive feedback and incorporate that? So I, I can speak to the feedback we've received from um, staff and students, and in particular, um, students of color. 
and the feedback that they gave um, was overwhelmingly positive about uh, the policy, which I think is really, really important because who's the intended, you know, who's the policy intended for? And I think it's really important that we keep that front of mind. So that's the um, the feedback that we've been um, seeking. We also uh, brought it to the admin committee and um, had feedback from our admin committee and yeah. Jenny, can yeah. I just follow that up? Sorry, what can I ask? What method you use to to gather student feedback? So Morag met with uh, three students. I believe it was three students, and she went through the um, the draft policy with them to get feedback on it. Um, and that's how we were made aware of the the information from our students. Yeah, Craig. Yes. Um, uh, like Tyler, I think this is an important uh, policy, but I have some concerns. And um, one of them is that um, we're becoming a very diverse society and there's oppression between groups that aren't white. There's uh, colonialism between groups that aren't white. And yet this seems to key on the historic thing of Canada and not with a recognition that there's a lot of different things going on. And I'm just, I'm just a little uncomfortable with just targeting that. Plus, I think, uh, as you said, you, she talked to three students and I don't think that's enough to, to get a fair representation of what students think. Just like, I don't think we've had enough parents com uh, comment on it. Uh, I would like to see a little bit more um, conversation on this because I think we've got one chance to get it right and we need to make sure it's, it's, it up, it's suitable for all people, not just a group of people. And the other thing is, is if you're going to develop a procedure, I think we need to have the procedure developed almost at the same time so that we as trustees can look at the policy and the procedure to make sure the procedure fits the policy. And so those are my concerns. Uh, other than I, I think it's important and, and I, I think we need to have a policy, but I'm just a little shaky on some of those items. So I can start with, um, well, maybe just go in order of how you have expressed your thoughts. So I think that when we, we certainly acknowledge that different groups can, can impose oppression on others um, and we would be remiss if we were to try and list them all. I think what we really want to focus on, if we look at that sentence, it's, or sorry, the sentence states, the board acknowledges that racism can be perpetuated at the individual, institutional and systemic level and is rooted in historical oppression, white supremacy and colonialism. And I, I think we would have a hard time arguing that our systems of today have been predominantly rooted in oppression from non-white groups one against another. Like the majority of our oppression that we experience specifically here in our local context would have to do with white supremacy when we take a look at our majority population versus our non-majority. So I think that that one, as much as we are not um, disagreeing with the idea that people could be racist or people could be oppressive towards other groups that are not white, it is rooted, our experience is rooted in white supremacy. We've had um, a teacher in the ATA who has no longer been able to teach within our schooling experience who taught the theory of white supremacy. Um, there, it's, it's, a part of, it's part of our textbooks, it's been a part of our culture. And so because that has a been a predominant impact, I think that part of it begins, or part of our method of addressing it so that we don't move forward in the same way is to acknowledge that it, it has in fact existed for us in an effort to be able to then further recognize when certain groups are, are imposing their rights on, or their, their wishes on other groups in the future. I think we have to acknowledge where our past piece has come from. And I, I understand, you know, like the, the, 
belief and philosophy about everyone contributing to a particular policy, which I think is important. But I also think it's important to keep in mind again who this policy is written for and that we're really clear on that because literature and statistics would show that students of color, staff of color experience racism on a daily basis. And our, our system is set up to, um, to favor white people over non-white people. And I also want to say too that I understand that th this policy does come with emotion and, and attached, there's emotion attached to that. But one of the things I've learned through the work of learning about anti-racism is it's okay to say white. It's okay to say whiteness, right? That's okay. And in fact, that's the proper terminology. So it's really important that we use that terminology. And just like our SOGI policy, I think it is important to look at the group of people who are going to be relieved when we have this policy. Right? The group of people that we are supporting in our division and, and taking a, a, making a statement about what we believe about historic, um, historical and systemic racism. So I think that's, that's very, very important. So I understand the perspective on um, creating policy that supports all, but this policy is specifically to support students of color and, and um, to talk about oppression and systemic oppression. So that's what it's specifically written for. It's not written for everyone. It's written for a specific, it is written for a specific group of humans that I want to take care of and I think our division wants to take care of. The other thing that I would say is that I understand too that the language does create discomfort and I would say to sit in that discomfort is okay and then, um, and, and then to call in empathy. We just had this conversation. We had a committee meeting this afternoon at our school. When we're feeling like, oh, who's this for? Like to, that's when we reach and into empathy and go, okay, who, who is this for? Who are we looking out for by having this policy? So I think that's important to acknowledge. That was the first point. That was only the first point, Craig. We'll go to. I think that's first and second. second. First, second. And then, oh, the last one was about developing procedure at the same time as policy. We're open to developing procedure, but we've never taken that path in the past. So we have set the policy first and then we have used that as our guide as to how we're going to do it. We've set our foundational beliefs. And um, so that's what we followed was tradition in this setting. And I, I can appreciate that there might be some desire to say, what does this mean we're signing up for? But at the same time, we're, what we're signing up for is this policy. And then we work to make it come true. We work to make it come to fruition in an effort to protect people. So I have Christina, Craig, and then Jenny. Go ahead, Christina. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to first start by saying thank you um, to the group of administrators and educators who invested a lot of time and effort and expertise into creating this policy um, in collaboration with your folks. Um, I'm just gonna put my hand down. Um, I also wanted to just like publicly thank the community members who have over many, many years generously offered us um, you know, invitations and calls to write relationships that this policy is in response to. Um, we've on many, many occasions as part of this division had parents, students and staff uh, share their experience of racism in our schools. And as part of our division's actions, this committee that was um, drafted this policy was created. Um, and just for some context for the board um, and for the public, I guess, uh, just as a reminder to us that the committee's mission from you know, some of the, the um, information we've been provided as a board, was to embark on a journey of individual responsibility, holding space for discomfort, uh, while personally acknowledging our privilege and bringing in self-awareness and discussion to important reflection and action. So that was what they've been working on. Um, and part of my statement is just as sort of a reminder to myself and to all of us that we all have a role in creating safe and caring and anti-racist schools. Um, and I would urge us as a board uh, to not fall back onto um, a very common pitfall of community change work that is that we don't want to rush things. Um, I would counter that this isn't just a one-time shot. Policies come back to this board often. Uh, we have a me method for that. Um, if things need to change in the future, if things don't work out the way we thought that they would, um, we do have a way to fix that. It's not a one-time deal. Um, and anti-racism work isn't ever going to be a one-time effort. Um, and so I would actually expect even if we felt very comfortable with this policy at all, you know, from every chair that um, that it would still come back because that's the work. Um, and I would say that in our schools, uh, you know, we can estimate that at least one in five of our students and staff are black, indigenous or people of color, um, and they're impacted every single day by the reality that this draft is working to address. 
and that the days that we delay in creating a statement and a resource for our schools to offer anti-racism support for these students and staff um, is another day that we place that burden on their shoulders rather than on our own. Um, and I know our entire board has a desire to address every issue of violence or safety and that we always work collaboratively with our entire division um, at all levels to create safety and inclusion for students. And I would see that this policy is meant to support that work um, and that it's been created with a lot of time, effort and expertise. Um, I think some there's some conversation to be had around maybe how do we um, get feedback on every policy? Because I think some of these questions are really valid around um, you know, how do we receive student feedback on policies? Uh, because all, all of our policies theoretically are for them, right? So how do we actually support their feedback on every level um, and from parents and things like that? Um, and I would just offer that, of course, like I think an understanding that of course policies won't end racism, <laughs> um, but as we all know, the policy is a, is a tool that we can use as, uh, as a board for our community. Um, and in February of this year, for Black History Month, our division issued a statement that shared a vision for a community of reflective, engaged citizens continuously striving for a culture free of racism and oppression. Um, and we also had last year, uh, you know, unfortunately, our division was in the media for um, students sharing their experience about racism in the schools. Um, and at that time, those very fabulous students, always so brilliant. Um, you know, reminded us that it can't just be students of color fighting for change. And so I would hope that we would consider these statements as an urgent call to action to create an anti-racism policy. Um, and I very much trust and believe that we'll be able to find a path forward to a more inclusive and safe school division for all students. Um, I very much like this policy. I think it's, um, you know, not necessarily even just a good starting place. I think it's another step. I don't think it's a starting step. I think many steps have happened to make this policy. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the for the draft to come forward. Thank you, uh, Craig, and then Jenny. Jenny. Um, I I really appreciate what's what's being developed here, and and um, Christina put it into words well. The the potential that it has to affect good change and to heal relationships, I think is, is the best terminology to describe what we're hoping to come out of this. Um, for me, I echo some of the sentiments that have been shared about the need for definitions and um, whether it's procedure or in the policy itself. For me, there's a concern if we put this out without it being complete that, um, we're looking to do good, but if if we're missing things, there's a potential to do harm um, because there's a potential for people to recognize what's missing. And, and so I do think that it needs those definitions and that it needs the completion um, that comes with, whether those are in procedures or that just fully fully explains this and and for the feedback piece i'm anticipating feedback as being something that gives us more insight and so if there's anything that we're missing or wordage that people are looking and hoping to see in it i would like to give a full and fair opportunity for us to collect that and to incorporate it and so I think this is very important and I recognize the process of first and second readings and, and things like that, but I'm hesitant to put forth something that doesn't feel fully complete um, and to then have to field those concerns. And so I, I would like to develop it more fully is my thought and, and to make sure that we have done all that we can to to ask people what they're looking for in this policy and and hoping to see and then and then also to make it visible once it's done and so because we have different avenues and places where we talk about the safety of our students and and their conduct and safe and caring environments i think it's important for those things to reference this so that when people are looking at well what's our anti-bullying policy they don't read that and go there's nothing in here about oppression or racism, they they need to they need to maybe be it needs it needs to be obvious and visible that we have this policy as well, and so I think there's 
there's an important factor in in weaving it in. And right now we have many, many, many policies, and so policies tend to be lost. And so I have a concern about this one being lost without that. Craig, oh, go ahead, Tracy. Um, I think student feedback is very important, and, and Chris Christina um, sparked my memory about last year and, and what our division experienced last year and the opportunity I had to sit with many, many students, not just last year, but through the years, um, our racialized students and their experiences every day and their hope that we would have a policy and that the language we would use in that policy um, reflect the true work of anti-racism. And so I think, yeah, for sure, I agree with you, Jenny, that, that feedback and hearing those things. What I would say is that the people who sit on the committee have the privilege of sitting with many students every day and hearing stories from students and parents that um, where you just like are called to do better every day, you know? And, and I would agree that this policy and the urgency we, we feel in, in this policy and in, in getting this policy out, and I agree with you, making it public and having it very public and being proud of this policy and standing by this policy, I would say uh, the urgency is there. So, yeah, I'll be quiet. Craig. The, the other concern I have is that in anti-oppression, we haven't talked about religion. And I, for one, have grown up in a situation where my religion was oppressed in this province by communities. It's been oppressed in the States. It's been oppressed until uh, some time. I'm not sure if you're aware, but historically, LDS people could not live within 20 miles of Leftbridge. That was passed by the city of Leftbridge. So my concern is that Yes, I know and I feel sorry and I feel because I have taught Indigenous kids in my career, 30% of my class was Indigenous. I realize we need to help them. We need to help people of minority colors. But anti-oppression means more than just that. There's religious oppression. And for me, I have a... My parents could not go to church in Clarisome because they were LDS. We had to build a church outside. So that's historical oppression. And I just feel like we haven't, haven't really defined that oppression because as, as much as, and I know we've got one in five are, are minority people and minority color, but until we, we fully define oppression more than just that, that's where I'm, I'm struggling with. And, I, and I'm sorry if this is personal, but it is, that I've seen that happen in, in our lives. And so I'm just a little leery right now. I, I want it to be the best policy going forward and not something that uh, we have to continually add to. I, I just think we need to take a little more time. I have Christine and then Andrea. Well, first, I want to thank you for all the work that you've put into this policy. I know it's been your committee administrators, student voice, your personal conversations coming in um, as, as you give your perspective within those meetings. And um, the line that's standing out to me right now is the board acknowledges that anti-racism and equity require continuous action, learning and improvement. And I think we need to remember that this will never be an all-encompassing policy. This will never be an ending conversation, right? And that's, and that's the hard work of having conversations about racism, advocacy about anti-racism, anti-oppression, and we will be continuously learning about others and about self. And what I appreciate about this um, policy coming forward is it allows us to have this conversation. I think it's important because when I think of um, one of our priorities as a board being in inclusion, I hold, I hold that as 
creating opportunity for hard conversation and creating a culture where we're allowed to sit in discomfort and feel safe sitting in our discomfort. I think that is essential and I think that is important. I'm allowed to be an individual who doesn't fully understand. I'm allowed to be an individual who may ask a question that may seem foolish, but I should be able to feel, to ask those questions freely without judgment. Um, I should be able to disagree and be able to share my perspective and stories to why I disagree and have that heard safely and given the opportunity to learn and grow and change in my perspective or perhaps choose not to, right? And, and so um, I'm excited that our division is on this journey. I think it's really, really essential for the health of our, of our community, for the health of our students and the health and support of our families. It's absolutely essential. Um, in reflection of the first time I read it, I did say to Morag, because the second, the second paragraph is alarming, and I think there's very loaded phrases used. And as Tyler said, when we, when we take in a loaded phrase or a loaded word, history and experience fill that definition. Right, and so I'm. I am supportive of having definitions present, and I and I appreciate the perspective of having it in the procedure over the policy. Um, I appreciate the logic behind that and the ability to shift it quickly. My only hesitation, right or wrong, is will people hang on long enough to get to the procedure to hear that definition, right, or will they just say, nope, not going to happen and pass. So then is that a missed learning opportunity for somebody should they be reading the, the policy? So that would be that would be my input on that. Um, another perspective I had is, um, it, I guess, question, is this systemic change alone or is it individual as well? Because it talks about um, we acknowledge that racism can be perpetuated at the individual, institutional, and systemic level, 100% agree, and is rooted in historical oppression, white supremacy, et cetera. So my question is, and help me understand more fully, these catalysts for racism for me fit systemic, but they don't always fit individual. And so I think it reads all as one encompassing. And so when I see us moving forward as a division, absolutely, Christina was right. Absolutely, you're right. We need to support our students. We need, they need to know that they're heard and that they're seen, that they're valuable, and um, that this is an essential change moving forward to both acknowledge and, and, and encompass um, grace, understanding, and inclusion um, as as seamlessly as breathing in our in our community, right? So my question is, does this wording bring that as best as it can? And how does it then, it addresses the systemic level to me, but not the individual. Does that make sense? Okay. So before we move on to Andrea Garrett, um, I'm understanding that the public are unable to hear our trustees that are on Teams. So are you able to check that when Andrea starts talking? Pardon? I can't hear what she's saying. Okay, so Andrea, you want to go ahead and start talking and then Garrett will give us the, if it's working or not. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your work on this policy. Um, I very much support it and I thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you for speaking so eloquently about it. Um, I do feel the urgency for this policy to go forward. And I don't think that this policy is trying to negate any kind of oppression that others may have felt. And I think that was important to note that it's a very specific policy for 
a group of teachers and students that feel this oppression on a daily basis. And so I very much do support it and I would be very willing to work um, on wording or on anything that would um, help it move forward. And so thank you very much for bringing it. Thank you, Andrea. So um, sorry that both Christina and Andrea's comments are not able to be heard by the public. Um, I think Garrett and Leanne will continue to work on that piece as we, oh, I think they're on YouTube and they're unable to hear it. That's the issue. So people are watching it on YouTube and can't hear. Okay. So, no. So. Just hang on. So they can log on to Teams? Okay. And the link is on the division website for the public to be able to Join on Teams. Okay, so they can click on public forum. We're good. Okay, and then Garrett is going to um, overlay the, because the recording is there from Teams, so those comments will still be added as best as possible from Garrett. So, so your messaging is not lost, Christina and Andrea, and we certainly all heard it here at the table, so thank you. Um, so just for my comments, uh, Definitely um, appreciate all the work that has gone into this. Not something that's just been fast or quick. It's been a lot of work and effort has gone in. Um, definitely echo the comments of my colleagues here today that they've shared in regards to the um, need to have this policy in place. I've certainly um, come and participated in some of the work over at Churchill when we've had guest speakers in and appreciated that opportunity. Um, one of the pieces that I also echo is in regards to the concern with the definitions. And over the weekend, um, so the, the package went out to the public on Friday. And over the weekend, I did hear back from some of our community members and there are people that don't typically sit on school council, but provided me with their feedback. And I really, when I look at it and I look at the feedback in regards to having definitions in policy, um, and I know that the pattern hasn't been that we've done that. And I think that there might be great benefit to adding it to the policy piece in the sense that when people read it, we're wanting them to understand, we're wanting them to know rather than hoping that they go on to the procedure piece, which they may not. And we want them to be able to read the policy, be able to understand the terminology that we have in it so that we are doing what we need to be doing with this policy. So for me, I think for it to go to first reading for myself, I would want to see that um, that would, we would review that um, for the definitions to be added to the policy would be a big piece for me, even though it is aside from what we've done previously. I do see the importance of having this policy go through, but um, I want it to be right and I don't want it to cause more angst in our community and I think that by adding policy we can help contribute to making this a great it is a great policy but it will just um, allow more people to understand understand the terminology and why it's in there so those will be my pieces are there further comments Craig based upon what's been discussed here and and I truly enjoyed listening and, and understanding. Um, I think I would move that the board realizes the importance of this policy, but feel that the policy is incomplete and needs to be uh, sent back for further discussion in school community and in the school community and the, pu and the public. And the board would like also to meet with the committee who proposes policy for further conversation. 
And and the reason I'm I'm saying that isn't that I'm against it. It's just that this is May, end of May. We have June, which is a very busy month for everybody with graduation, year-end stuff. And to really, truly, I think, talk about this and develop it and, and to support it fully, I think it should be tabled till the 1st of September and then we can go forward with it. It gives people a chance to look at it. It gives uh, us a little bit better chance to understand it more. And so uh, that's the reason of the motion. Leanne, were you able to capture that? You have it written out, Craig? Yeah. Are you able to go take it over to her? Well, she can't read my writing. Oh, she can't read your writing? Go yeah, ahead. I'll just put... Okay, the board realizes the importance of this policy, but feel that the policy is incomplete and needs to be further discussed in the school, community, and with, uh, popul and with people. And the board would like to meet with the committee who proposed this policy for further conversation. Therefore, I move that this table, this policy be tabled until the fall. Uh, meet with the committee who proposed this policy for further conversation and that we table this motion until the fall. Christine, did you have something? Thank you. I just wasn't, um, I didn't know if you had reflections on what I was speaking to, but if you did, I would really appreciate hearing your perspectives. A dance up here. Um, I wanted to comment because I'm trying to go in order of what um, the comments you made, and I appreciate what you said about, I'm just going to steal the, the beginning of the policy, oh, yeah. where um, it talks about um, proactive action is required to create an anti-racist environment and also about um, commitment to learning. That was really, really important to our committee. So I appreciate you highlighting that because I do think the work of anti, the anti-racism work and anti-oppression work, there's never an end, there's never, there's never an end point. It will continually be hopefully a conversation that we engage in. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you for seeing that and, and, um, and appreciating that because that took time for us to think about and write. Um, the, you need that part. You can go, you can go on that. Okay, we'll just go back and forth. Um, I think that when we take, and I, I also appreciate the comments and, and have taken to heart some of the questions that you've asked, and they are many of the questions that we, ex we explored around the table. I would be very cautious for each of us to ever get to a stage where we are letting perfect be the enemy of good. So I think that if we are looking for the perfect wording, if we're looking for the perfect policy and procedure combination, if we're looking for the perfect time, I don't believe that we're going to come across perfect. We may need to settle for good with the open willingness to work at continuous change in learning and adjustment. When we take a look at the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression, when we talk about why didn't people step up? Why didn't people say something when we each have been present for things that we know in our hearts are not right? So often we fall back on, I'm not sure that I'm the one who's most qualified to speak on that. I'm not sure that it's me who holds the most experience or the most fill in the blank, the most whatever it is to be perfect enough to have the perfect words in the perfect moment to be able to address the issue. And so if we are looking for perfect, I'm not sure that fall will be good enough. I'm not sure that ever will be good enough. If we are looking for action right now for oppression that we know is happening in our schools every single day and in our systems, and, and that takes me back to the comment, the question that you asked about whether or not the individual is represented well enough in here. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, that gives me pause for reflection. I think when we look at individual actions and the way that systems are made up of individual actions. And so when we have a call to action like this and we're calling on changes to our institutions and our systems, that will happen through individuals, but perhaps perhaps that needs to be addressed differently so that when I read this as a community member, I 
am forced to reflect on what my role is as opposed to the greater society or the greater systems role. But I would be cautious in that if we're looking to get the most people's buy-in into this, that does that ability to transfer it a little bit further away from the eye and look at what our system needs to do may give us enough courage and 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 ability to say, oh, it's not necessarily me all on my shoulders doing bad things. It's the system and we need to change the system. Sometimes talking about the system gives us a little bit more comfort than what the individual. And so when we look at pointing out the individual in here, I just want to be cautious that that doesn't further alienate people from taking the action that they're capable of taking as individuals. But I don't know what the answer is to that. That's We would love to discuss that further as a committee and as a group and with anyone who'd like to take part in it. But I, I just wanted to I just wanted to put it out there that I worry about finding the exact right thing to say in each moment. And because it is an ongoing discussion, I think if we put it off until the fall, there's going to be there's going to be new research, right? Which is great, but then we need to continue to update our policy and continue to come back to the table and talk about it. Um, the other thing that I would say about the individual versus the the system, which is such an important conversation when we talk about racism, is that we all have the capacity to be racist. Each and every one of us. I do. Everyone around this table has the capacity, and as a, and but it's the the willingness to reflect on that and to say, okay, and then how am I complicit in a system that is that is built on racism and oppression, right? And how do we how do we um, dismantle that? So, yeah. Thank you. Additional comments. There is the motion on the floor, Tyler. Okay, speaking to Craig's motion to table. Um, little wordy for me, but <laughs> I can get on board. I'm a little torn in this one because if even if we do approve a first reading, we can discuss it later. But I don't know. I think I think for a lot of the trustees, it's like we haven't. Obviously, you've done this for you've put a lot of time and effort into this. And I think maybe I know personally, I haven't. I haven't had enough, even just hearing some of the new things pop up here in conversation that, well, yeah, okay, well, maybe I got to think about that. So I'm a little torn between the two, but I think in the end, um, I think in the end for me that it's, it's, it's going to be, it's a policy of the board. So the board needs to really understand it. And I think that all the trustees need to be comfortable with where they're at on implementing the policy. So obviously some of us um, are further along than others in the continuum of, of their comfort level with how this has been worded now and how it is. So um, I guess I'd say I, I will I will go towards tabling it uh, for now uh, based on that. But I can see arguments on both sides for moving forward or not but I guess at this point being that it's being that it's a board policy I think the board needs to everyone on the board needs to be comfortable with where they're at and uh, that that the, the policy is addressing their their thoughts and wishes on this um, based on the, the great information that we we've gotten there so and I, I don't see everybody being there quite yet so thanks okay. So I just have a question. Would the inclusion of definitions help the timeline? Or if that would be helpful, I would just offer up on behalf of the committee that we could have that agreed upon within the week. I mean, we were using definitions and, and agreeing upon ideas before putting so that we could have common understanding. So we and we benefited from that experience. If that would be helpful to you, we would be happy to draw up the definitions, but I also don't know procedurally how that works. But if it's a matter of that, then we'd be happy to do the work. For me, I think that would really help. I think it would for some of the others too, but I can't speak for them, but I think it would help for me for sure. And there is still opportunity. We still have another board meeting coming to um, relook at that if, the, if we do get information quickly, yes. I, I, think it's, I think it would be. 
And I think for me, I don't support the motion. I would support the first reading with us having the understanding that definitions would be out within a week. And that um, my understanding with first reading is that it still then goes back out to all of the stakeholder groups. So that still gives us that opportunity to get the feedback that we're looking for, as well as trustees with us. Um, I had the opportunity to see it beforehand because I had come to policy meeting, but a number of trustees Friday was the first time for them to see it as well. So for me, that would be the um, way that I would like to proceed and I won't be voting in favor of the motion that's on the floor. But um, if we can look at um, that piece, depending on what happens with the motion that is currently on the floor. Craig? Yeah, um, I think the motions brought out the desired outcome for the board. I'm I'm willing to drop the motion uh, if if there's a commitment that the definitions will come forward before the second before our June meeting, and 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 I think that like Tyler and I both agree is that I think that's a and Allison that's a key part to this this policy to make sure that if the definitions are there, then I think we can basically live with it and work with it and improve it through the, through the proper process. So I'm willing to drop the motion. So you need to rescind, rescind. the motion. I rescind the motion. Okay, so Craig is rescinding the motion. Um, so I need somebody, if we're gonna look at going forward with the first reading, I can certainly do that. So I would like to make a motion to move forward with the first reading with the plan that we would have definitions um, put into this policy within a week and it's sent out to the stakeholders for us to review again for um, potential second reading at our June board meeting. I, that confuses me. Okay, let me restate it and then you can have discussion. So um, I move that we um, approve this for first reading with the plan that definitions would be inserted into the policy within a week and it's sent out to stakeholders to, review, to, for, uh, to provide feedback and for this to come back to our June board meeting for potential second reading. Pretty much what I said. Okay, so the motion is on the... Floor and Jenny. So it's approved for first reading, but we don't have it in full. Like we don't know what those definitions say yet. So you'll be able to take a look at those because they'll be but out to us within a that week. Then be the first reading of the policy. Are we adding those definitions to the policy? We're going to add them to the policy within a week. Not to procedures. Not to procedures. It doesn't seem like a first reading. So after a first reading, you can still make amendments to a, a policy, and that's what's happening is amendments will be made to the policy. So, And, and I've certainly read the... Um, definitions that Edmonton Public has put out. So I would, I'm making an assumption here that it would be along those lines of what Edmonton Public has, and I'm seeing nods across the room. So um, to me, I'm comfortable with that. That doesn't mean that everybody else, again, with this just coming out on Friday to some trustees as being the first time they've seen it, they haven't necessarily had the opportunity to do any um, further research. So for a number of trustees, this is very, very new. Yeah. Tricia. Uh, Jenny, the First reading, it's still a draft policy. So before it goes to the second reading, you'll have opportunity then to make feedback and, and whatever else you need to add to it. And then at second reading, if it's not 100% supported, it doesn't go on to the third reading until a future meeting. So, uh, Craig? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's important to realize that uh, after the, if we pass it as a, as a first reading, that all the stakeholders will be given a chance to look at it again, and especially if you add the definitions and then get feedback from them. So it can be amended uh, as we go forward. So I, I would speak in favor of that motion. Okay. 
Hey, any other comments? Tyler. Okay, now that we're on the policy then, I would like to look at 1.7. And I'm just trying to read my notes here. Of, I think the word available in 1.7 should move to after the word recourse. So it would read, have avenues of recourse available without fear or reprisal. I think it reads better, moving that word there. I don't know what that <laughs> means, but... Leanne, can you... Yeah, English wasn't my thing, but I just didn't read right. Leanne, um, can you increase the font on that? Thank you. And then I Perfect. had a different... I don't know, I have two different policies in front of me for some reason, but I think it looks like you, are, you guys already looked at the one and fixed it, so... In the school... Division, yeah. So the other one I saw, you guys had already seen from one draft to the next and taken care of it. So anyways, that's it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Craig? So when the procedure is made up, is that where you would probably see some more information on the individual as far as racist actions by an individual? So that's your, your goal is to take some of that put it into procedure and then change it as it as needs be. But it would address some of the concerns that Christine had and would address some of our concerns. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Seeing no further comments or questions, those in, oh, go ahead, Kelly. Yes, just one question of clarification. Yes. Are we defining words at our discretion? Are we choosing the words that of just looking at the limits to the number of definitions yeah. you would like to see, or shall we do that? And I know in Edmonton, reason? they define quite a lot. Yes. For me, um, it's the three, the historical oppression, white supremacy, and colonialism okay. is the priority for me. Yeah. Um, I'm not speaking for everybody by any means, but those are a priority. And I know Edmonton had more. We would likely take, because there was some discussion as well on some other words and are we, have, are we shared in our understanding of what those words yes. are before we put them in? So we might include those ones that the committee discussed, but okay. we could, so as long as we're good to make a fairly comprehensive list to be added to within reason. Okay. Tyler and then Christine. I would just say as well, it looks like we have those three and whether it's historical oppression or oppression, I think based on the policy, we need to define oppression, we need to define racism. So as long as racism's added in. Christine. And I agree with you, Kaylee. I think it's important that we're all on the same page. So for me personally, have as many definitions as you want, and then we can to get together choose which ones to keep in and which ones to remove. Jenny. I think um, Tyler referenced a few times the general population, and, and I think that um, racism is understood generally. Systemic racism is not always understood generally. And so I think that people need to understand the intention of this as well. And so that's not as much a definition as a um, informational piece that I think is important to include to help people understand the intent and that what systemic racism is, if that makes sense. It is a little bit of a definition, I guess, but whatever value that feedback is to you. Sounds good, Jenny. I, I think, sorry, for me, what's important to me and the reason I have some level of hesitancy with this as it stands is my concern is for people's reaction to it to be political. And so when I ran in the election, the thing I heard most was education has become too politicized and everybody wants to see more education and less politics, right? And I don't want, I don't want, like, like somebody referenced the, you know, Lethbridge is a little bit divided. 
And I don't want to, I, I really, really want this to be what it is intended to be and to be received really positive in a really positive way. And so sometimes we do have phrases and, and, and words that become charged and inappropriately often they become charged and and um, emotional and and they elicit responses and and so I think that when you're thinking through what do we need to define I think anything that can lead to education and to understanding and to pr be preventative to that politicalized misunderstanding that that we run the potential of running into and so I really really want this policy I just really want it to be ready and so I hesitate to put that one, one week deadline on you because I, I feel like there is, we, I, I don't want it to be dismissed by people who go, oh, this is just achieving whatever agenda or, or whatever. I don't want there to be a dismissiveness to this. I want it to be valuable. I'll let them answer and then I have Christina and Christine. I agree. I think that um, creating, like, assigning um, political values to racism is the wrong is the wrong thing to do. And I think racism is apolitical. I think it's about humanity and taking care of our students and staff and our community members who are racialized. Um, so I, I agree with you. I don't think it should be a political statement. And that's why I think it's really important that we use the proper definitions and that we're not using words that are. Um, that are going to be taken out of context. When you look at the actual definitions, when we provide you with the book of definitions, you will see that um, they it really is about proper terminology and that to politicize, I think that's on, okay, so you guys are in a different role, right? But for people to politicize racism, that's that, they're making that decision, right? Because racism is about humanity, is about what's doing what's right and providing fair and equitable access to all students. and. You know, Allison has heard my rant on, on city transportation and the barriers for city transportation that our kids face. When you look at who faces those barriers, let's just take a deep look at, you know, who has equitable access to city transit and a, and a monthly bus pass. So, so I, I, I could go off on like rant, so I apologize, but I agree with you in that it shouldn't be a political statement. This is not about politics. This is about looking after our kids and recognizing the day-to-day racism that they face and, and this system of oppression that, that we're a part of. So that was just a comment, Jenny, to your comment. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. And actually, before we move on, I do just need to do public forum. It's five after five. I see nothing. Is that correct? Okay. Um, Kaylee, you were going to the mic. I was just going to say, I, I hear you. We would love, we need for the intention to be heard before we start to nitpick at different words. That's what we need people to hear and to understand as we're looking at this policy and how we'll execute it. I think that's why we put in this length of a preamble and we actually cut out paragraphs yeah. because if you give us enough space, we will take it. But that's that was, that was the goal of the committee as well. So when we have the preamble of the board's acknowledgement of the existence and the roles, and then also our... Um, I don't want to call it a belief statement, but essentially a belief statement in the diversity of students, staff, and families is a strength. That is that is a belief, right? That's not necessarily a fact. We could debate either side of it, but it's a belief that we commonly share. And so then when we go on to say what we recognize and what we respect, that was our effort at bringing forth or starting with an intention and then moving on to the what is it that we are saying, and then the procedure will be the how will we follow it up. So. Um, we could certainly expand that, but our worry is it would be very much different than the other policies as well as it already is, because we don't typically even have this length of a preamble, but we can add stuff in. Thank you. Christina and then Christine. Christine. Thanks. Um, yeah, Denny, I just wanted to um, to echo that. I think um, I hear the concern about the sense that policy could be read as political um, and wanting to make sure that we really focus in on education as the goal. And I think really that's our role as board members is when we have a a, um, a, pol a board policy that that is our job to make sure that we know how it impacts education and that 
um, you know, remembering that um, the students and staff who have like for many years asked for this type of policy um, are also part of the general public and that um, this policy is also, um, you know, it's it's their policy as well and, it, and that um, that we can defend these types of policies by, you know, reminding folks that this isn't about an agenda. This is a, a need that it allows for education. Students that go to school and experience racism are deprived of education because of those experiences that cause them to have to miss school, to be distracted from school, to not feel welcome at school and in their classrooms, or from the same with staff, right? To feel uncomfortable in your workplace um, because of racism. And so um, I would just encourage us as staff or as uh, board members to um, hold that responsibility with ourselves. So I appreciate that call to to make sure that we tie this back to education because really th that's ultimately what it is on many levels like many you know um international and national organizations have repeatedly called racism a public health um like disaster really and um and a public health concern and i would say the same about education racism is like a very strong education um you know, barrier at this point. Um, and Tracy, I agree with the, <laughs> the transportation. I think that's a great example, right? How do we, how do students access it? So um, I think that we're, we're, we have a consensus that we, we obviously all want students to have equitable access to our education. And so I hope that we see this as a tool for that. Hey, Christine. I'll be very brief because I agree with Tracy and Christina and, and I hear your heart behind that concern for sure. And Jenny and, um, at the end of the day, yes, we can do our best um, to bring forward the best policy that serves our students and su supports our students and shows them that we are wanting to change forward positively um, and support them. Um, at the end of the day, we can't control how people do respond. We can do our best, but we can't control that. And I think to for us as a board to take that on as as an extension of the responsibility for this conversation within our community of what does inclusion look like, right? And um, it's hard, we're the politicians of the division and so we get the brunt of those conversations often, but um, I think if we, we shift the narrative to, it's a really great opportunity to expand the scope of understanding, um, there's benefit to those conversations as well. Craig. Just a, a quick comment. I think that this discussion by the board and, and members of the committee shows how you can have a respectful discussion on a tough issue and that we appreciate your honesty and your approach and I hope you appreciate our viewpoints as well and that as a community this is what we need to do. We need to have conversations like that and still respect one another even though we might be slightly different in our viewpoint. And I think that's been a, and it's on YouTube, so I hope people watching will see that you can have a tough conversation with respect and be able to come to a, to a outcome that's passable for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. And Cheryl. I have just more of a logistic comment to make. Um, as the, the definitions are constructed, and as the board thinks about what that might look like in policy, I just want to suggest perhaps that, uh, and, and the board can decide this when it's presented to them, that uh, the definitions can be an appendix, just like you have, for example, the student code of conduct um, for your review today is an appendix. Often what happens if you have a lengthy, lengthy list of definitions in a policy, the strength of the policy is lost. The message of the policy is lost. An appendix, the board can make the decision when they vote that that appendix Remember, you, it says that the, the superintendent has the authority to develop procedures. An appendix can very much be the board's, and it's not going to take away from the power of the policy. I'm just going to, so that you're thinking about that head and you don't hear that from me next week and say what it, but I'm just saying that really when you think about if this does end up being a lengthy list of definitions and not just the three words in the second paragraph that the board would like to see for education of our community, and for clarification to the policy, it really does, I want you to think about what that might look like as an appendix, it doesn't have to be decided tonight, but certainly I feel that when you have a lengthy list of definitions, it really takes away from the messaging of the policy because people get lost in the definition. So just, just a thought. Thank you. Seeing no further 
comments or questions, we'll move to a vote. So those in favor? And those, oh, and that's carried. Thank you. Thank you for all your work and sorry we're putting more work on you in the short period of time, but uh, we, ap we appreciate it and um, all together we have work to do on this. So we appreciate the work that you guys are going to put in over the next week. And thank you. We'll s probably see you back next month. Right? It's cooling down right now. Thank you. So, Trish, we'll go back. Okay, to, to policy 502.1. So, this is an annual review of the Student Code of Conduct Appendix A. Go ahead, Cheryl. Um, the reason that the board reviews this appendix, the, the student code of conduct every year is because you're compelled to do so in the Education Act, right? And so the Education Act asks that this be reviewed annually and we make sure that it's uh, on the website and that it uh, is connected to school websites. And so this, uh, there are no changes recommended. Um, it's a fairly strong, and the student code of conduct is very, guided and scripted by the Education Act yes. um, because the Education Act is very specific in terms of what needs to be in the Student Code of Conduct. So just a little background there. Craig. Oh, I think it's a good uh, policy. I'm just wondering, and I'll just leave it with the committee that I should have talked about this before, but that might be also a good reference to put in under the anti-racism, anti-oppression is the student code of conduct because it does answer some things that uh, that happen bullying discrimination stuff like that it's mm -hmm. written in there so i would just think that it might be a good to just add that to your reference okay any other comments or questions seeing none um somebody going to are you making oh, these motions, Carl? Uh, I, I move that we approve policy 502.1, Student Code of Conduct. What would you say? We don't need to. Or you need to say that it's uh, an appendix. Oh, the uh, appendix A. And Jenny, you were making a comment. OK. <laughs> Seeing no comments or questions, those in favor? And that's carries. Next is 602.5. Okay, policy 602.5, knowledge and employability courses. Uh, so most of this was added, um, a better explanation of what knowledge and employability courses offer students, according to the Alberta Guide to Education, uh, when the program can be accessed, certificate of achievement, pathways, and parental awareness of the program. Go ahead, Jenny. So when it says deleted, it wasn't actually like, I thought you were left with like one sentence here. It was a not a very long policy before. So did, was the blue added or is it being yes. deleted? Blue the was blue added. was added. Oh, because it says deleted in the side? No, the word and was deleted. Oh, okay. I yeah. was like, why even bother? By the time we were done with what was left in black, <laughs> that was my yeah, comment. No. Blue, blue is new. <laughs> Craig. Looks good. Good job. Um, Thank you. <laughs> since um, I was golfing down in Montana during this <laughs> meeting, uh, I would defer to Christina to make the motions on it because she was the chairperson at the meeting. Okay. And sure. seeing no other comments, I would certainly like to comment. I was part of the meeting back prior to the one before, mm -hmm. and um, I appreciate all the additions to mm -hmm. this one. It definitely um, brings it uh, really in line 
to what is actually occurring in the division. So um, I think as uh, hearing from feedback from people, this really reflects what happens with the k and &E program and um, how our staff run and operate it. So I appreciate that this really reflects that. So thank you. Yes. Tyler. Um, I'm not even sure how to say this one. This, the way this, uh, I guess to be this it, under policy, so the second sentence, I find, I, I certainly want to at least rejig the order that it comes in because I find where we say these courses provide students with opportunities to experience success. That sounds patronizing to me. I don't, I don't know how else to explain that. I don't like the way that's worded. It's like, oh, well, we're giving you this so you can find a way to have success. I, d I don't like that at all. I really like, like, it, it definitely for me needs to start with provide students with opportunities to enhance academic and occupational competencies, transition into employment, do all these good things. And then, frankly, I just see once you've put in the real meat of what this is supposed to do, that experience success just doesn't even need to be there. So, uh, anyways, that's how I feel. I feel it's... I feel like it's patronizing to somebody in a in a K and E program. That's how I feel when they say experience success. So I, I guess I would say I would I would try to amend that. To, uh, you know what? I would just get, get rid experience of it. success. Other comments? Christina? Yeah. Uh, we're just working on the amendment piece. Yeah. Sorry. If I'm hearing Tyler correctly, Tyler, should I read the way it would read uh, with yours? Um, the board recognizes the importance of the knowledge and employability programs. Caney courses shall be able. These courses provide students uh, with opportunity to enhance academic and occupational competencies, transition into employment and or continuing education and training opportunities, and develop citizenship skills. Mm -hmm. We can, instead well, of saying and training skills, we could put a slash and or continuing education slash training opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One less and. Hey. So, Christina, you uh, make the motion as amended. Okay. Any, any further discussion? And those in favor? And that's carried. And next is 604.3. Okay, 604.3, locally developed courses. So additional information on why and how locally developed courses are developed uh, were added into this policy. Comments or questions? Not seeing any. Um, who's making the motion? Christina, go ahead. Thank you. Any further discussion? And those in favor? That's carried. And that's carried. And next is policy 606.1. 606.1, alternative programs. So in this policy, as you can see, there was not uh, very many changes at all, except just to the Education Act, um, updating that and um, capitalizing the alternative program as it is in 
the outreach programs um, handbook. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions or comments. Christina. And those in favor? And that's carried. And 606.3. 606.3 outreach program. So changes to policy are provided by the Education Act and Alberta Education Outreach Program Handbook and the funding manual for school authorities. So there were several changes made in this policy or not changes, but additions added to this policy. Any questions or comments on this one? Seeing none, go ahead, Christina. Thank you, those in favor? And that's carried. And I think that's it, Trish. That's it. Thanks Thank for spending you. all this time with us. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and we will see you next month. Thank you. Perfect, so with that, I'm wondering, do we need a um, five minute break or are we wanting to keep going? Not seeing either way. Pardon? There's quite a bit left, yeah. Yeah, you're not done by six. <laughs> no. Yeah, 9.30. Oh, yeah, nine, yeah. Okay, so I'm not seeing in favor of having a break, so let's move on then. Are we wanting a break? Okay, I want a break. Anybody else? Okay, so five minutes. So we're back, 5.30, and we'll take a...
He'll come in. Thank you. So we're going to jump back up to where we were on the agenda. And um, so we're going back up to 6.5, which is the superintendent for the curriculum up update. So the board should have received a handout at the front of that handout. It has implementation timeline. Do you see that in your pile? Right. Six point five curriculum update. So there's the handout that that Leanne just distributed at the table, and so it it looks has the timeline on the front note. You've got this. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's the that's the right one. So just keeping the board informed on what's happening with curriculum implementation. I think that you're all fairly aware of the timeline, but it's there for you just in case. We've got the uh, the April 2022, of course, this spring, the release of the K-6, to ELAL K-6 Mathematics K-6 Pew curriculum. And uh, so in, in May, uh, there was a release updated draft K-6 curriculum for science, French, okay, French, 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 hold on. One's French immersion and one's French first language. So sorry, yeah, one, one is French first language, right, which is like your francophone schools and one's French immersion. And so, of course, in blue, there's what, so what's really happening this fall? We've got the implementation of K-3, to English language arts and literature, as well as the mathematics K to three and K to six physical education and wellness curriculum. So those are being implemented. That's uh, so the professional learning I talked about earlier this board meeting focused on all uh, building capacity in all of our elementary schools for K to three ELAL and K to three mathematics. We'll be focusing on strategies for the physical education and wellness, uh, developing the capacity for the implementation of that curriculum in the in the fall, and that's for K to six for the. Now there is uh, opportunity um, to pilot K to six science, as well as as I mentioned, French immersion and uh, French. French first language, that's the francophone. And so we did uh, let uh, Karen and I, Karen Rancier, curriculum director, and myself let our elementary principals know that last time we met with them, they'd be taking it to their staff, that if there's um, any interest in piloting the K-6 to science uh, curriculum, the timeline is short. We would have to submit that by June 6th. And so that's the timeline for that. We haven't had any expression of interest so far, but mind you, today was sort of a school-based uh, day, and so we'll we'll find out whether or not that's the case. Often, one of the advantages that comes with piloting a curriculum is that you sort of get sort of an advanced review of resources, which isn't the case. There aren't resources ready, and so, um, but certainly you do get advanced. Uh, sort of that advanced look at practice with um, the outcomes. And so um, we, we're leaving that because it doesn't have to be division decision. Uh, we've left that to let principals to let us know if there's any expression of interest in, in that piece. Then in the uh, fall, there's going to be a draft K-6 to curriculum for fine arts and piloting. They anticipate sometime in the fall we'll begin with that. And then we go to move to 2023 with the release of the final K-6 to curriculum, science, fine arts, and the French first language and French immersion. And September 2023 is implementation, as you see in the blue there. So blue means, okay, that's when you do it. And when it's not blue, that means when there's opportunities for piloting. So that's the timeline for you. I won't read through all of the details unless you've got questions for me. So... Um, there is claim that there was content changes to um, the uh, science uh, in terms of the ones that are being piloted in terms of 
content load, age appropriateness, wording clarity, and uh, the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit content. Uh, we don't know, we haven't seen that yet, so um, we, I can't comment on that. The supporting of teachers with resources, there is the newlearnalberta.ca, and uh, our teachers, part of their in-servicing, our learning on the 9th and 10th, as well as their learning today, is knowing how to access sort of a learning board or a resource board. Uh, on there. And then, of course, we've got uh, there's the next steps in the curriculum implementation there for you to read through, unless there's, I could go through them, but uh, that's there for your information. On the very last page is there's been money allocated for curriculum implementation. And so we know that there's um, resources, and we just received notice today. And Christine Lee, do you think I can remember the amount? We just got it this morning, our notice. 227,000, something like that. 200 and something. Yeah. yeah, but that's right, 27. So we've, uh, so now certainly uh, Karen will begin to, I know that Karen met with um, a team of people last week to review resources and make some decisions in anticipation of receiving the funds. So they'll be moving forward with that as soon as possible. We haven't received, we, we filled out a spreadsheet um, of information for the province, and that was due, I sent it in last Thursday, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, and we anticipate that soon we should be receiving information regarding how much money will be, will be allocated for professional learning and release time. Right, probably early June. Craig. Oh, the, um, the math for the six in English language uh, if it's optional this year, are we going to, ha were you talking about having some of the teachers pilot that four to six this year, or is it just the K to three, uh, K to six science and French immersion language? The, the, the province would not consider the math and the LAL as a pilot. They would consider that you can choose to implement it or not choose to implement it. It's not considered a pilot. But can we implement it on a per teacher thing or does it have to be divisional wide? It doesn't have to be divisional wide, but it would be um, because we're doing all of our professional. That those teachers wouldn't have the, the professional learning support of a pilot team, nor would they have the professional learning support of the division team, and so that would be quite a significant gap for those teachers. Should we say, go ahead and do that? But the division is focusing on K to three professional learning for ELAL and mathematics. If they were to pilot science or if our French immersion school starts, then they have the support of the province as part of a pilot team. So given that, uh, then in 20, 2023, we would have teachers implementing grade four to six math and eight language arts without ever having looked at it or tested. tested no, we right. would have full professional learning support as we are doing now with our K-3 to three okay. teachers, right? So as a team and as a collaborative community, the director and our lead teachers would begin by midway through next year, begin supporting those teachers in the development of their curriculum for the implementation okay. year. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Cheryl in regards to curriculum update? Seeing none, thank you for that. And I know that it's been lots of work on preparing the teachers, so thank you. And school graduations. That's there for your information. So I, I, I believe that, uh, and thank you, Leanne, for gathering the information regarding graduations and, and what the role of individuals will be in graduations. I'm just trying to find the right page. Right, it was emailed out. So unless there's any questions. Seeing no questions, we're good. Um, Leanne, do you need people to message you back that they're attending? Mm -hmm. For each of them, okay. Each of them, okay. Right, and you. so, so um, some schools,
invite the, and that's what it says, the liaison and the executive council liaison, not necessarily the whole board, right? And so if, if uh, you know, it just depends upon the school. And so you get, you'll, you should receive invitations to schools. Sounds good. Thank you. And then moving on to school liaison. Oh, no, that's been moved. Calendar of events. That's there for trustees, unless there's something that we missed. Anything anybody's noticed? Awesome. I think, oh, Christine. I know it'll come later, but just the community conversation state. Yes. Okay. So we will add, we will add community conversations once we have the date in a oh, little bit here. Date. Okay. okay. Perfect. So moving on next, I have the Win Par video and evening. I've seen it, so it's totally up to people. But Tyler. I just must make my point again that it's all over and happened and now the video is here. Look, I really want to see it when we get our our Edwin Parr nominee here. That's when I think we should see the video of what Perfect. that person has accomplished when, when they're here okay. with the board. Sounds good. Thank you. Duly noted. Craig. I would just say that if, if that's the case, then we'd have to do it in camera so that the public doesn't see it and uh, nobody else sees it and we're bound by silence not to talk about it. So it was uh, definitely a wonderful opportunity to to share with all the individuals across our zone and to have our um, representative there was fabulous and to watch the video amongst all the rest and it was a fabulous video that was done. So thank you. Go ahead, Tyler. Either, either that or maybe we just have the Edwin Parr person come in. No, I guess we need to meet them before the... We need to meet them before the actual event. So, okay, sorry. Okay, so now we're back to action items and on to 8.3, authorization of locally developed courses, middle school. I got to scroll in my... As I pass it. So the, the, the middle school, you'll see <coughs> me, a list um, of courses. Um, and as, as is noted in the memo, um, the, cor the courses for grades 7 to 9 options or electives, what some schools call them, um, is approved by the board. Karen Rantz here, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, works closely to develop course outlines and student learning outcomes for each course. Um, although the courses are categorized by school, it is recommended that the courses be approved for use in all division schools, right? So when the motion is made, it's an approval of the list. And so just if you approve the list of uh, grade seven to nine locally developed courses for use in all Lethbridge School Division schools, um, then you've approved uh, the entire list unless there's any questions about any of those exploratories. Craig. Yeah, I'm just wondering, based on <clears throat> the email that we got and, and that about band and music and that at GS Lakey and at uh, Senator Joyce Fairburn, are those locally developed courses or, and should they be, are they government courses? So yeah, so any band or music program is, is an Alberta education curriculum that would be followed. Including it's not a mandatory curriculum, but it's a curriculum that would be followed. And that would include like percussion, rock and roll, whatever they want to do? Yeah, it depends because they're taking the music curriculum and and, and it's the same outcomes just through a different um, medium. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Jenny. Um, I just wondered what is the process for things that are less 
obviously um, academic, like that are more creative in their education, like escape rooms or board rooms or, I mean, board games or Harry Potter or things like that. What is our mechanism for um, um, looking at the evidence-based, like what is our evidence-based education? Like how do we look at this to ensure that it is educational and evidence-based education type, you know, Right. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Now, one of our to... board priorities is to ensure evidence-based education. And so how do we, do we look at a course outline? How do we determine that, say, a board game class is, or a Harry Potter class is, is, is meeting the criteria? That's a great question. And so I haven't had a chance to look at all of them, but if you click on that link that was on your board agenda package, you will find it takes you to all of the course outlines for those courses. And so when, when we think about evidence-based learning, we have to sometimes broaden our understanding of that. So for example, um, if we think of Chinook High School that delivers liberal education 2022, that's a games and puzzles course. Um, because the outcomes at the university level, the outcomes for that course is to teach uh, thinking. And, uh, and so when you take a look at, for example, escaped rooms and cryptography, really that's focusing on student learning outcomes of critical thinking and problem solving, not much different than a university liberal education course. And so all of those, um, all of those um, courses do have course outlines. I haven't reviewed them all, not, but I know Karen's reviewed them all, and so they all have course outlines, and the learning outcomes uh, should should be delineated in each of those. I know that, um, you know, from working with Karen, I think she reviews these quite carefully and ensures that the schools do have their learning outcomes, um, as well as a list of resources and assessment practices for each of those schools. So the schools that are having changes to their band and music, um, those are based on interest from students, those changes. Enrollment. Right, and I, I, I sent out an email, I, I think, that, that sort of gave quite a bit of detail with yes. that. And so the school went through, and let's all do all of our middle schools, go through a process. So um, they determine level of interest from students. So they... they whether that's registration, pre-registration, or survey, they determine level of interest for all of the different elective programs. Um, they also have to, so they're guided by student level of interest. They're all guided by staff expertise in the school. Um, and 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 so, for example, if we talk about GS Lakey, as I indicated on my email, um, actually, they've probably got more fine arts and music and instrumentation and vocal opportunities than any of our middle schools, just not the traditional form of those opportunities. And so I sent you links to the different courses and programs they offer. Um, I think they've got five or six different fine arts electives that are um, associated with, uh, with music and with voice. And if you take a look at, for example, some of the pictures I sent you, you'll see traditional instruments like the saxophone, um, trumpet, saxophone, uh, trombone mixed in with um, what would be considered more contemporary, although they're really not that contemporary instruments, and students engaging in vocal at the same time. And so the traditional way of delivering music has sort of evolved and that may be because Lakey um, is, um, has been historically a hugely fine arts school. You've got some really creative staff there who have sort of evolved. So where you're seeing what did kids select? Um, they selected guitar. They selected, uh, they have an option next year. I think you might have seen that is um, sort of for a great big musical production where all of the kids work together in terms of uh, organizing and understanding the production and doing the production and so they they do have a lot of make choices they have a lot of choices where they can engage in vocal uh, as well as other fine arts areas such as dance and two-dimensional art craig just following up on that <clears throat> uh, how with the pandemic and a lot of that wasn't able to be done uh, 
children might not have that experience in grade six of playing in a band or something. And so then when it comes to grade eight or seven, and all of a sudden they don't know what they're missing. Is there, is there anything in our division that if a parent feels their child should take a band that they can move schools to where there is a traditional band? Just oh, asking Oh, absolutely. That. They can. And, and any parent who's required has been told they can. Okay. So they absolutely can. Um, that's our uh, out of attendance boundary school choice, out of attendance boundary policy. And there's room because there is room at Senator Joyce Fairbairn um, at, and and students sort of move back and forth. There's some students, for example, who are in Senator Joyce Fairbairn boundaries that go to Lakey for the dance program, right? Just okay. like there might be some who would like to go to Fairbairn for the traditional band program. And the parents are aware of that? Yes, any parent that's inquired is aware, aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Tyler. I move that the board approve the use of the above list of locally developed courses, locally developed grade nine grade six to nine courses in all division middle and high schools from September 1st, 2022 to August 31st, 2026. Excellent. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? And can you put the trustees back on the screen for me? No, thank you. Perfect. Uh, seeing no further questions, those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. And looking for a motion to extend past clock. And Craig is making that motion. And those in favor? Andrea and Andrea. Okay, and that's in favor. That's carried. Thank you. And moving on to authorization of locally developed courses, high school. Okay, this is a little bit more work because each course has to be recorded separately for submission to Alberta Education. So what you see. Uh, below is that uh, there the, we are guided by uh, Alberta education, um, education and what is required for approval of high school locally developed courses. It's a more rigorous process. And so when they expire, the ones that you see listed below will expire August 31st, 2022. And so they require another motion by the board. Um, and the, the recommendations for the amount of time for the motions is below um, for each of the each of the courses. And so uh, really these are very uh, thoughtful choices with respect. High school does have a huge breadth of curriculum, but there are some specialty areas that you see below that the schools have expressed that they would like to have, uh, well, a, a reaffirmation or another a motion by the board to can authorize the use of these courses. Go ahead, Christine. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the continued use of LDC 3138 Chemistry Advanced 35 for three credits until August 31st, 2025 to provide continuance of program offerings to students. Thank you. Any questions or comments? And those in favor? And that's carried. Go ahead, Christine. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the continued use of LDC 1515 competencies in Math 15 for five credits until August 31st, 2026 to provide continuance of program offerings to students. Thank you. Not seeing any questions. Those in favor? Oh, go ahead, Craig. Uh, we got a question. Just out of curiosity, what Math 15 is a grade 10 subject or is it a compared to math, well, I don't even know what they call them anymore, math 30, pure math 30, whatever. Right, so math 15 is sort of a bridging course okay. uh, between math 9 and math 10. Math 10 C, because there's not a math 10 now is one course. Okay. And so some students are, are uh, uh, feel that by taking math, it's becoming more popular, especially this is a really great bridging course with the COVID gaps and kids who may not feel confident finishing grade nine math and going right into math 10. It's, it's okay. a bridging course that helps build their grade nine into grade 10. All right, thank you. Thank you. And those in favor? And that's carried. Go ahead, Christine. I move that the Board of, of Trustees approve the continued use of LDC 3458 Leadership in the Arts 2022-35 for three and five credits until August 31st, 2026 to provide continuance of program offerings to students. Seeing no questions, those in favor? And that's carried. Go ahead. 
I move that the Board of Trustees approve the continued use of learning strategies 15, 25. Oh, do I have to do these all separate? I can read them together. Okay. 15, 25, and 35, LDC 1599, LDC 2599, LDC 3599 for three and five credits until August 31st, 2026 to provide continuance of program offerings to students. Thank you. Uh, Craig? Yeah, just could uh, Cheryl just explain what that is, please? The learning strategies take students through a series of ways that they can study, learn all the way from um, the development, learning how to read a textbook, something as simple as learning how to read chapters in an index and headers, okay. to being able to navigate visual images and read charts and graphs, to being able to study and remember doing um, concept mapping. And so it really moves into learning through um, well, by developing your own personal strategies for learning. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, those in favor? It's a big delay to Newfoundland. There we go. <laughs> That's carried. Thank you. Go ahead, Christine. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the continued use of LDC 3155 Psychology Abnormal 35 for three credits until August 31st, 2026 to provide continuance of program offerings to students. Thank you. Seeing no questions, those in favor? And that's carried. Go ahead with the last one. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the continued use of Technical Theater 15, 25, and 35 LDC 1987, LDC 2987, LDC 3987 for three and five credits until August 31st, 2026 to provide continuance of program offerings to students. Thank you. Seeing no questions, those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you for those. And now on to the assurance plan approval. And I think it's working, is it working? Yeah. So just um, before I review the assurance plan, a reminder that, you know, in terms of governance, there's, there's three really big important, four, four big important documents that the board um, looks at. So you've got your budget, uh, which will be coming up tomorrow. You have your audited financial statements as part of your uh, governance and uh, jurisprudence over. Uh, and then you've got your assurance plan. This, the assurance plan, is what we do. This is what I call the work. And so this is what guides decision making on the part of uh, administration, your senior administration in terms of uh, where we spend our energy and how we prioritize. This guides the board because you have a governance section, right, in terms of um, what it is that you prioritize and what your work is. And it certainly guides um, all of the education center leaders in terms of curriculum or how we're supporting schools, inclusive learning. And it guides our, our um, school administrators. School education plans are, their template is built on the board assurance, sorry, I keep saying it's okay, assurance plan. And so this does truly guide the work in a school over the course of the next school year. And so um, this is a document that um, I'm hopeful that the board has had the opportunity to read through as I go through it. I hope, I'm hopeful that it, it's a document that the board um, references or refers to if you're wondering about what it is that we're doing. As you know, every single board meeting, I give you a board priorities report. And that board priorities report is grounded in um, the, that, the assurance plan of the current year. And so the board assurance report that you get every month, that's four or five pages long, um, is giving you an update on all of the strategies that are listed in the assurance plan for the 21-22 school year. So this document really guides what it is that we do in the school division. And so, and this document, just like the budget is built from um, a variety of different sources, uh, so is the assurance plan. So the assurance plan, um, as you know, I brought to the board uh, the themes that came out of 
town hall. That wasn't only for budget, that was for the assurance plan. We spent two days uh, doing strategic planning and the priorities that came out of that strategic plan are in here. As well, I work, I spend an entire day with school administrators and we do strategic planning to refine it further. And, uh, and of course they take it to their staff. So it has as well as information um, that comes from um, any of the results that we have at hand. So there's a variety of uh, sources of information that guide this. There's a breadth of expertise that's put into the plan. And so when you take a look at the context development piece, for example, um, it's the people who oversee those areas um, that write those messages. So I just wanted to start with that piece. And I'm not going to read the whole plan, obviously, because we'd be here for a very long time. Um, but I think it does, uh, um, because it is such a critical document, uh, that we could spend a little bit of time going through some of the highlights. And so the jurisdiction profile is there. That just gives uh, the reader an understanding of what uh, what it is that Lethbridge School Division is in terms of place and size and that type of thing. Then we've got our guiding principles for assurance. This is the second year our planning is guided by uh, the assurance, the provincial assurance framework. And on page eight, I give a reminder of how the assurance framework of the province aligns with the division um, priorities. And so those that model is there is for you and for the public, certainly. Um, one thing, one of the fundamental principles of assurance plans for school division is that there's ongoing reflection. And so, as you know, we've got our ongoing reporting of measures and we've got our assurance dashboard that board members and the public can go to. And so that's the next couple pages explains that. And when we've shown the board that page before. So one of the first domains in the assurance framework is the local and societal context. Now you'll notice there's quite a few pages that, that provide background for our local and societal context, because this is really, how is it that we're meeting the needs of our population? What is our context and what is it that we're doing um, to address the needs of our population? And so we've got very um, thorough uh, accounting of what it is that we're doing in English as a second language program and limited formal schooling. We've talked about that before with the board. You know, we have 1,207 English language learners. That's a significant number of students when you think about diversity in our school division. And 454 of those are refugee students. And so some of those students have had very limited formal education. Our young students are integrated into our elementary classrooms. Um, they're able to have successful integration. Our older students um, most often go to the limited formal schooling program that we have at Wilson Middle School, GS Lakey Middle School, and Winston Churchill High School, where uh, there's a real strong focus on developing literacy skills so that those young men and women can successfully uh, move forward with uh, education or occupational choices that they have. And so there's a lengthy explanation of that piece. And I think on page 11, it is important to note that we really are fortunate to have such diversity within our schools. Um, certainly there's structures that we have in place and have needed to put in place to support those learners successfully, um, but they give back so much uh, to uh, the students in our schools. Supporting families, that's page 12. Uh, we've had our mental health capacity building program for a number of years and of course they work on the prevention piece and they work on education so universal strategies in education in classrooms um, and supporting teachers with that instruction we also have our four family support workers uh, which has been part of our family connections program for our making connections program for a number of years and they work more directly in almost similar to almost a social work role where they're supporting vulnerable families and vulnerable students. Uh, we've got, we've I've spoken a number of times about our off-campus uh, program and how fortunate we are. Actually, we've got, um, I think it is for registered apprenticeship program. I think we only have something like 30 less places than Calgary, for example. We have a very um, strong off-campus program and of course programs are always the people who do the programs and we're very fortunate to have Andrew Crow and team as well as uh, and that's a that's a division program and we made that decision about 
four years ago um, to centralize um, and, and sort of uh, make sure that we were maximizing um, what we could do in Lethbridge by having uh, one person oversee a number of different things and schools not overlapping in, in their responsibilities. The anti-racism, anti-oppression work has been ongoing um, in support of uh, families of diversity. Uh, we can take a look at health and wellness. Certainly that's been, as you know, a topic of conversation all through uh, COVID and we've been looking um, at and, and have met those challenges in a variety of ways, uh, including um, education, universal programs for students, nutrition, wellness, wellness grants, and a holistic approach to wellness in our division. And of course, we've had our breakfast, lunch, or healthy snack programs in a number of schools across the division. Wellness grants, actually, we talked about that earlier, I think, this meeting. And the Think Outside program, well, that was, uh, that was a presentation today. So that's something that we're really excited about growing over the course of time. Inclusive education, uh, really the, the conversations that we have in terms of providing support for students with exceptionalities, providing support for diverse classrooms, providing support for classrooms where you have a breadth of, of where students are accessing curriculum at different levels. Um, we talk about it through the lens of responsive teaching and identified support strategies for individual students. And so we use a response to intervention RTI squared framework and that's about how do we provide intervention and instruction to meet the needs of all of our students. We talk a lot about universal strategies, UDL, universal design for learning. And of course we use, uh, we've really focused over the last three, four years on using assessment to inform instruction. Assessment not, isn't only for measuring, assessment really is to inform instruction so that we can make sure that we're identifying the learning needs of students. And of course, was but part of inclusive learning and meeting the needs of students. Let's not forget our professional team, which are absolutely essential uh, to meeting the needs of students with exceptionalities, and that's including our speech language pathologists, um, our occupational therapists, and our psychologists, as well as our lead uh, teacher and early learning team. On page 17 is the early education program. And this year with uh, 18 early education programs at nine different school sites. Technology, we are so fortunate in this school division to have a really progressive lens on the integration of technology in our classrooms. I, have to, I can't say enough about our director of technology, Jesse, Jesse Sadlowski, and how he can inspire schools to be really um, take risks and be experimental with, with technology and integrate it into instruction and have it as part of the integral um, education environment. We've really grown in that area over the course of COVID. Um, so, you know, COVID did have some good learning lessons there. Technology was one of them, but it also brought some challenges and we've got some challenges that we're very aware of in terms of digital citizenship and certainly the impact that social media and student use of social media is having in our, on our schools. And for the most part, that's use of social media outside of school time, but it has a strong impact on what's happening in schools. Growth and staff demographics, uh, we're lucky to get Mike's report monthly in terms of the kind of, and you know, this is, when you think about the amount of things that happen in human resources, it's actually astonishing. Um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, uh, just about 1,200 uh, contracted employees and that as well as a number of other employees um, that come into our system uh, and, the, and the ongoing hiring and turnover and onboarding and induction uh, of employees is uh, our team in human resources does a phenomenal uh, job with uh, recruitment, onboarding and retention strategies for our staff. And um, actually, we're way bigger than our small team in HR would represent in terms of serving. There's not too many organizations that serve that many staff um, with the size that they have. And we've got the early education programming with the public education system. We've talked about that. And, you know, really we're partners. I just wanted to highlight there that we're partners with the University of Lethbridge. And I know, for example, um, the city of Lethbridge has just recently um, set as one of their priorities. And I think uh, Christine and Alice knew would have heard that when we met with the, um, and we just had to sort of give a 
polite reminder that we've been a partner with the University of Lethbridge for five years now in terms of uh, the brain strategy. And so that's something that we continue to be part of and are proud of. Curriculum development assessment, I just gave a curriculum report. We'll be focusing heavily on curriculum development. And so that's our context. That's the long part, isn't it? Because it's important that our public understand what it is that we're doing to meet the needs of students. Now we get to the next piece. So our domains of governance, uh, student growth and achievement, teaching and learning, and learning supports. This is the, now here's what we're going to do this year. That's what this is saying. This is what we're doing for 2022-2023. So the governance, of course, you've seen this. Um, and I know that I reviewed this as the board wished following the um, strategic planning retreat. I reviewed this with Allison and Christine. And uh, this is sort of the, what the board decided uh, would be their major strategies. And some of them aren't necessarily decisions as are mandated by the province. So as we go through this, we've got um, outcome one um, is a mandatory outcome. And um, what the strategies are is, uh, so governance engage students and their families, staff and community members in the creation and ongoing implementation of a shared vision for student success. That's required as is number two, three, four and five at the top of page 20. Number six is what uh, this board added as a as your outcome um, governance governors engage in advocacy to promote change and action with government policy priorities and or financial allocation that impact board priorities and the well-being of students and so the strategies listed under each of those areas um, are strategies that the board um, during strategic planning said remember if you you know yeah keep that strategy change that strategy, add this strategy. And so, for example, under the engagement of stakeholders, strategies that had been in place um, uh, for, uh, for a while, so town hall meetings, community engagement website, um, the diversity parent table, board community engagement committee, school division, school council, um, all of those pieces the board had put on, yes, let's continue with those, and then added in um, the, the, the community conversations piece. And then, of course, continued with the strategies that were in place for positive group relationships and positive community relationships. Outcome two, again, that outcome is mandated as part of a, a, any board's assurance plan. And underneath are those... Uh, pieces or the, these actions, the strategies that this board will use um, to meet, uh, meet that outcome. So all the way from having the joint, this is sort of how, how are you partnering with other um, local, uh, municipal or um, provincial partners? And that basically lists the kinds of partners that uh, the board works with. The outcome three the um, that's required as well for the board and really that has to do with your fiscal uh, responsibility and so it talks about budget process uh, financial reporting um, and of course uh, risk management is something that uh, Christine Lee has uh, taken as she had all of us working hard here the other morning actually I know doing the risk management charts for the board uh, to take a look at our risk management strategy in the fall Outcome four uh, is also a provincially required outcome. Curriculum is articulated and designed for implementation. In this division, of course, we've got, we keep you informed of uh, changes in curriculum or what's happening with implementation of curriculum and our, the individual who oversees, who has the primary responsibility for overseeing curriculum is our curriculum director, Karen Ronsier. Then we have the cycle of continuous improvement and that's making sure that we've got transparent, ongoing reporting. Now, the requirement for reporting is the November um, assurance results report, but this division has moved forward, as have some other divisions in the province with the, with the dashboard that has ongoing. When we do have new uh, results, those go up on the dashboard and are, are, are available immediately to our public. And then the outcome six, the advocacy, uh, those were strategies at the end of advocacy that the board added at the strategic planning session.
So I'll stop there. This is, of course, this is the board. This is the work for the board, I guess we could say. Any comments on that section? Craig. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I can accept the governance part. Um, I felt that at our board retreat, we didn't have adequate discussion amongst the board themselves. Uh, we were more or less guided on a bunch of stuff. And uh, as I read number six, financial allocation that impacts board priorities and the well-being of students, we made certain suggestions and they haven't been taken up by the administration, such as um, more EAs, uh, maybe looking at uh, some I issues that uh, we discussed. But I just, I just don't feel that that adequately portrays what I think should have taken place as a board discussion and governance. And I felt that uh, we weren't given a lot of opportunity to sit down just amongst little groups and discuss. It was, to me, it was like a lecture sitting at university and every so often, let's put something up on the board and you can vote on it. So I have a problem with the governance part. I don't have a problem with anything else. But because of the governance, I might not vote in favor of the insurance plan just because I do not think it really reflects my feeling or maybe maybe I'm alone on this, but I don't really feel that it reflected what I think should have taken place at our board retreat. And uh, and so that's my comment. Do you have any suggestions of what you would want to see different in that section? Well, unfortunately, the time is limited, but I would say that uh, going forward, that a, a, a board retreat should be interactive among small groups discussing what we think. We've got, we put a whole bunch of stuff on the parking lot and uh, we have yet to um, discuss any of them. And uh, if that's board priorities, the parking lot, then uh, since February, we haven't discussed it, I don't think. And uh, I just felt that uh, we're trying to be dictated to in, in a certain way. Uh, I have not filled out that form because I did not think it was a, a good form to fill in. Uh, was this governance or not? Uh, is this a price? They were all important issues, and yet we have not taken the time as a board to discuss any of those in a free, without bounds discussion. And that's what I, I feel we're lacking. We aren't able to fully develop or talk about things. Uh, we're always under pressure to finish things. And uh, so my thing is, is until we discuss the uh, parking lot, which which could change some of our governance things, I'm not willing to accept it. Other comments on the governance section or on Craig's comments? Christine. I don't know if I fully understand where you're coming from, Craig, but first I think to publicly question and malign the integrity of our executive council is a significant accusation. And I don't receive that lightly. I don't hear that lightly. That doesn't mean that I don't believe in accountability. I don't believe in conversations. But I think that's a pretty significant accusation, especially when I look at this report and I see how much time has gone into it. And I, I also was at the retreat and, you know, my feedback prior before in previous years has been, wow, like I do wish we had more time for conversation. Our board chair put forward that questionnaire and the purpose of that questionnaire was to discern, okay, all of the, all of the issues presented, all of the questions presented were important. What is worthy of a committee of the whole? What is worthy of a presentation? What is worthy of 
um, individual reflection and um, research and to discern that. And the way I hear you presenting it was, is I didn't fill it in because I didn't agree with it. So I'm just not going to fill it in. But this is the first time you've said anything about that. As far as I know, I don't know if you've had conversations with our board chair about this, about this questionnaire. So I think to bring that up in this fashion, in a questionable fashion within this context, isn't necessarily appropriate or helpful because it's it feels instigating to me rather than why did we have that and what was the purpose behind it. Um, I I do feel that our executive council does work hard to do to do the work that we ask, and so when I hear. When I hear the the statement of we brought up um, suggestions and they weren't done, because we make a suggestion as a board, does that mean it therefore needs to be done? And and I'm just going to follow it with this: What is a governance responsibility, and then what is an administrative responsibility in in, in policy? Our our role as governors is to create policy and the administrative tasks are on this team that joins us at board meeting. And so I guess I would just appreciate hearing just under, further understanding of that statement. I in no way am dismissing the work of our admin team. They work hard. There's no doubt about it. I am concerned that, and maybe we should go into camera to discuss more of this, but I am concerned about some of the things that have happened. But let me just go on. I did talk to the board chair about that um, thing, and I just felt that I didn't want to fill it in right now because there were certain questions. If you look at it, every one of those questions could be governance. So why are we asked between yes and no? Um, the second thing is, is I think sometimes people um, misinterpret. If the board so chooses to spend money in a certain way, then it is the responsibility and it's voted on and it's passed by a majority, then it's the responsibility of the admin team to follow that through because our most important thing is the budget. So I'm just saying that we as a board can make decisions that might not be as agreeable to the administration as they would like, but because we're the governance body, we can so do that if there's a majority. And then they're bound to do the best that they can to figure that out. Um, there were some, I mean, outcome three, I'm okay with. I just, I did not like just one and two. I, again, it goes back. Uh, I was, thinking about when is the most appropriate time to, to visit that. Uh, our board meetings have been full and our board meetings have been long. And uh, when I read the governance report, the assurance report, I agreed with just about everything. I just did not agree with the domain of governance. And I've expressed my opinions. And it is in no way dismissal of anybody and their work that they've done in this division. And I. And I want that made very emphatically clear. But we can have a tough discussion about some of the process. And that's what I'm bringing up. It's just, that's my feeling. Uh, perceived or reality, that's how I feel. And if you're not allowed to speak that, then I think we have a problem. Now, some of the items maybe we should discuss in camera, and I'm willing to go in camera to discuss those. But overall, that's just my feeling of the events. Christine. I appreciate that. And my question in countering isn't saying you shouldn't be able to say. That's not what I was intending and so I apologize if you if you hear that from me um, I am inquiring just to help understand Thank you Tyler and then Cheryl 
Well, I don't know. Maybe Cheryl wants to go first. I was just going to say, I think at this point, we're discussing the, ins the assurance plan. And I think that we're really getting off topic here. I get that you made your point, and it's a valid point that you don't agree with one and two in the assurance plan, and you, you may vote against it, and that's great, and that's okay. But I think we're now drifting from discussing the insurance plan into different a different area that should be brought up as a topic at a different time based on that topic. So I would just like to see us get back to the insurance plan then moving forward and go from there. I'm Cheryl, Jenny, and then Craig. I just want to say in the, in the sake of transparency, this, the board strategic planning took place in March. During that strategic planning, just to review the process that happened, all of the governance outcomes were put on. And as I mentioned, outcomes one, two, three, four, and five are required by government. Those outcomes are required by government. Outcome six is, is a Lethbridge School Division outcome. In that process, there at no time from my recollection did administration or executive council ever direct the board to think or act or talk in one way or another. The board made all the decisions about what do we keep, what do we revise, what do we add in all areas. Now, granted, was there opportunity for robust discussion given the length of time and the number of strategies and outcomes, likely not. But I want to emphasize that this governance section was not developed by administration. This governance section was put up on the wall at the board strategic planning. The board discussed every section of it. The board made the decision to keep or add or remove or change or make their own. The strategies, the, sorry, the outcomes themselves couldn't be changed because they're requirements. And so I'm curious, you know, that it's been two months since that time. It's certainly never been brought to my attention that there was dissatisfaction with process or that the board felt that their governance conversation was something they didn't own or have ownership of. The board chair has not said that to me, um, nor um, has have you, Craig. And so um, in terms of if there was, it would have been helpful if before, for myself personally, before this meeting, if that would have been a conversation of with the board, if you didn't feel that you were represented in the terms of governance at that strategic planning. I'm just saying I'm, I'm surprised by this because I haven't heard anything um, from any of the board members that that was the case. And so this is somewhat of a surprise for me, having that the assurance plan is to be looked at and voted on. And so while I can appreciate and certainly it is absolutely up to this board if they vote on this plan or not, um, and we can certainly request permission to have a late plan if you choose not to um, vote on this plan as it's represented. But this governance section was not constructed by administration. The form that you're referring to that went out was not constructed by administration. That was constructed by the board um, for the board to have an understanding of what they wanted to go to first. So maybe I'm misinterpreting, Craig, but the way I'm interpreting your comments is that we've been over directive in the governance area. And I would like details or explanations in terms of where uh, we've been over directive in any of these areas or in terms of our process. You're okay with Jenny going first? Okay, Jenny and then Craig. Um, I am, mm, I think that I can understand some of the sentiment of, of uh, like for myself, my experience has been, because this is our first year here, I've sometimes been anticipating when, when we are going to have this opportunity to have discussion as a board and anticipating that it's coming at some point. And, and I, so if I'm understanding your sentiment correctly, I can, I can echo a little bit the sentiment of thinking, oh, okay, I thought that that would happen, that we would have more discussion, that we would develop our own vision plans and we would develop our own priorities. And, and, and a lot of what we're working off of is what was previously developed. 
And so instead of maybe sitting down and coming up with our own original thoughts and content, we're often choosing between content that already exists and voting on it and, and things like that. And so for myself, I'm still anticipating a uh, time when we sit as a board and develop the board vision of this board or the priorities of this board. But I think that the process was followed at that at that meeting. And it's it's a process that if we feel like we want to make changes to, I think that's a good conversation to have for a future board planning meeting. But I I understand that there is a requirement for us to for you to present an assurance plan and that there is a deadline attached to that as well. And I'm trying to remember if I've read that deadline in the superintendent, the superintendent, um, what are they called? Requirements. It's from the, it's required from the Alberta government somewhere. Education Act. Quality standards. Quality standards. Is that where it's required? That's not where it's required. It's a board requirement. Is it just a board requirement? Okay. So then, so what my, I guess what my question for you, Craig, is are you looking to explain why you will not be voting in favor or are you looking for an action to be taken? Given the short timeline, um, I'd like to address a couple of things. One is that uh, I think, I agree with Tyler, we've got off the topic. Two, there are some concerns that uh, would be better expressed in camera. And uh, three, I just, I guess I look at our number six and I don't see really where we've, we've really had a good discussion on that. And, um, and so I understand one to five, absolutely. That's government requirement. I don't, I don't, I have, there's a few things I think we've, we tend to go too deep in some of the stuff where we want to write down, like keep it simple. Uh, but uh, I don't think we fully looked at outcome number six. Uh, and uh, so that's my feeling. And uh, I will refrain from any other comments other than some of the comments that I have should be done in camera. Okay, I'm Christina, go ahead. Okay, so Christina has made a motion for us to approve the assurance plan. Um, Andrea, we haven't heard from you. Do you have any comments? You're on mute. And for me, comments, um, I do believe some of it is off track in the sense of the parking lot piece. The items in the parking lot are things that um, will influence the, how we do the work we're going to do over the next year, but I don't think that they are necessarily pertinent to being in this piece. Um, when I look at um, strategy, uh, um, outcome six, strategy advocacy, those were items that we had um, reviewed. And if that's the area that you're having concern with. Is there something that you could add or that you're not happy with in regards to the advocacy piece? Because that was the only, um, like, advocacy. Those I feel that those are the things that we had spoken about. And uh, when you speak of the other things, I do believe that those are for an in-camera conversation. But are there areas within this that you would like to see different or that you don't feel that they reflect the advocacy that we spoke about doing um, when we were at the retreat? Well, uh, no, I, I just leave my comments as it is. Um, I do agree with you that it 
there's a number of things that should be discussed in camera, and uh, I look forward to discussing them in camera. Okay. And for me, that would look at some of those process pieces where, um, you know, I think as a new board, and I can certainly appreciate where, um, you know, Jenny's coming from in terms of what happens next. So we had the retreat and, and then what happens next in terms of how do we get to, we need to approve this by May 30th. So I think some of those process pieces we can certainly have some conversation on, but we do have on the floor a motion to approve the assurance plan as presented. So with that, is there any further Further conversation? We're ready to vote. Those in favor? And those opposed? And that is carried. Go ahead. Because we're still in the public meeting, I think it's important for me to note that I am somewhat adverse to having this move to a in-camera meeting as if there's been something misconstrued or not done right by administration. And I do, t I am, because that would be the reason that it would be moved. And, and I just want to remind this board that I discussed with the board prior to strategic planning what format it would take. The board agreed not to pursue a new vision and mission. We had a conversation about that as a board because they felt they needed to have a year of governance and that next year, board would undertake a process to do vision and mission. Does anyone remember that conversation? We had that conversation. It was not Cheryl Gilmore who decided what the board retreat would look like. I reviewed the process of the board strategic planning with the board prior to finalizing. I reviewed the process with the board prior to finalizing it. And so, you know, the, the idea of going in camera as if there's something that administration has done, I do take exception to. And I do want to make it clear in public that the process was approved by the board prior to the board's strategic planning. Craig and then Jenny. There are things that um, I'm not discounting the fact that the board approved that. I would probably be remiss in that I probably should have voted against it when it was brought forward. But I don't know if there was actually a motion on that. So anyway, um, I guess my concern is that um, there have been issues brought up by other trustees that for a full discussion, the public does not need to hear it, as it says in the Education Act. If it's a, some sort of issue that we feel it's best not to discuss in public, well, then that's, I, I think that would be a, a situation. I'm not discounting the ability of anyone. I'm not discounting the uh, work ethic. I'm just saying that uh, that in my mind, some of the decisions haven't really been a motion, it's just sort of been sort of looked at and then we go on and you kind of wonder, well, what did we decide? Because there's been, as far as I'm concerned now, I could be wrong, but I don't think there was a motion to talk about how the strategic plan would take place. And so I stand to be corrected, uh, but this is just my feeling and uh, That's, uh, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to point fingers at anyone, but um, I do take exception that, uh, that by going in camera, that would be adverse to people. I don't think it is. So that's my final comment. I will not make any more comments. Jenny. My comment was just to say that I was away for February, so I think I missed that decision. So I apologize for not being aware that we had decided not to make a mission statement or vision statement. I don't even know what it's called. Um, and then I think that what I was trying to say is I didn't understand the process until I'd been through it. And now that I've been through it, 
I can recognize areas where I would make suggestion for um, progress or, you know, there's, there's things that were good and things that I think that I would like to see more of mostly just um, around time and time is always limited and time to, for different conversations. And, and, but I think that that is for a different purpose and a different time. And I think that what we're looking at is, was the outlined plan followed? And I think it was, and I think it's been followed and, and filled and presented to us accurately and fully. And so, um, and then I think too, that, that with our, with that number six and our fiscal allocation that we've had a lot of conversation around budget. And, and this was my comment previous with the board is if we actually really want something changed or done, we have to give clear, we have to make a motion and vote on it and give clear direction to the division that that's what we want. And so if we aren't doing that, then we're not failing to do it because we haven't asked for it. And so conversation about what we'd like is just generalized conversation. And so um, I think that it's important for us to recognize our own responsibility in that as well. Thank you. Seeing no further comments or questions, we'll move on to the next item is 8.6 policy 204.6 organizational meetings. That's Craig. Okay. Um, this was brought up in April. Uh, Tyler made a comment that he'd like to look at it a little more. And so it's been brought back up in uh, May. Uh, I know a number of boards have their organizational meeting at the start of the school year, not two months into it. Um, I, when I say the organizational meeting needs to be held in conjunction with the regular meeting. So, I mean, really we're talking about both policies. Um, we're not looking at long meetings. We're looking at maybe uh, an hour or less on the organizational meeting and an hour just to be brought up to date with what's happening in the division. Uh, look at it that where our last meeting is in June and we go to the end of September, that's three months without any discussion, knowledge, or anything about what's happening in our division. If we're consider considered about governance, then I think we need to look at it and say, we do need to have a short meeting in August, um, notwithstanding the fact that school starts. But if other boards are doing it, either in August or the first week of September, surely our board could do it. And and I do think there's some, uh, you can go in and find out, but I'm pretty sure just about every board in Southern Alberta has their organizational meeting either at the end of August or the first of September. So. I would, uh, I would hope that we would look at this favorably and uh, make the uh, amendment to the uh, organizational meeting. Christine. Do you have a number of, of how many boards meet in August? So I can certainly address that in terms of I did a just serious preparing for the meeting, did a quick look over um, and it's about half is more where it is. So it's either um, they do it either in August or the first week of September, or they're doing it in October for the organizational meeting piece. So it's about down the middle. Tyler. Can we get a motion for this so far? There's just information coming out and there's no motion on the floor. There's, there's no motion. I Can we get something, please? So I see that Craig has a motion here and I would just like to speak to the fact that um, I would like to see if this, if this is made into a motion that it be separate from the regular meeting piece would be my recommendation. I don't know how others feel, but I would like, if there's a motion then I would like to, 
yes, as two totally separate conversations, because to me, I feel that they are separate, but how it is written in this recommendation, they're not separate. And then I would like to have a discussion if you're willing to make a motion of that nature. I, I would just move that the organizational meeting be held either the last week of August or the first week of September. Thank you. So the motion's on the floor. Um, discussion, questions, comments? Yep. Um, refresh my memory. Our first organizational meeting, was it an independent meeting? So it's like we did an organizational meeting first, and then we did swearing in and then did we have a full meeting or were we yes. done? Yeah. So then we have a regular meeting. We had a full meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to remember. So you do both and we do it in October. We did it in October, but obviously we weren't elected prior right. to that. Right. So I just wanted to remember. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I'm fine with that motion. So I'm not, or Craig, go ahead. I should put in uh, an amendment to that, that except in the year of election, Perfect. which then the meeting would take place at the last week of October to clarify it. Okay. So for me, for, I did want to take a look and see kind of, to me, it makes sense to have an organizational meeting at the beginning of the year, and then you're ready and you're prepared for any meetings that are happening at the beginning of the year as a board, we're just ready to go into our year and, and move on. So I did, you know, do some looking just to kind of see where we were at in comparison to the other boards and did see that it's, you know, pretty much a split. So for me, I'd like to hear potentially other comments in regards to why to have it in October versus having it in um end of August or beginning of September. To me, I really wanted this to be separate from a regular meeting because I don't necessarily support that we have a regular meeting. But to me, I feel organizationally for us to be ready and prepared for the year, for us to have a meeting and to prepare and get ready doesn't necessarily mean we have to connect a regular board meeting to that. But when I did look at all the all the divisions that do have an organizational meeting, they also do have a regular meeting at the same time. That's the only pieces I'll add. Christine. Okay, at the risk of being unprofessional with this question, can this board truly have an hour only meeting for organizational? But my, I agree that it's good to not wait till October. I think that's a really um, good observation because you're right. When we have our organizational meeting at the end of October, then we're shifting committees and sometimes one trustee goes to their first committee meeting in October and then they then we switch in November, right? And so that's not streamlined. So I, I think I could see value in having the organizational meeting prior to our first meeting in September with the exception of an election year, I think. Um, I, am, I am hesitant to do it in August my reasons for my hesit hesitancy are um, I don't want to have to call back staff from vacation time to lead this meeting. I believe our administrative teams are quite busy just with the school startup piece. And I don't think we need to have be organized per se in our roles in our committee those first couple of weeks of school. I don't think we need to do that. Um, and so I would be supportive of a shift to for a regular board meeting in September, but I don't necessarily um, see the need to have it earlier than that. Tyler. Um, I'm good with moving an organizational meeting to, um, yeah, only in September though. I don't want it in August and I certainly don't want it before the um, September long weekend. That is a time when people are just, there's a ton of people away. There's a ton of people taking last minute vacations, doing things. Administration is super busy trying to get organized for the school year, everything else. So I, I don't want anything to do with that. And when we get to the other meeting, I don't want anything to do with the, the regular meeting then either. But I do agree that um, organizationally, it would be good for us to just, rather than switching liaisons after a month for schools or whatever, we get organized. I do also believe, and you're not going to believe I'm going to say this, I believe we can have an hour-long meeting for organizational. Only reason is because in an organizational meeting, all we do is elect committees. So there's no discussion, there's no topics, There's we're not, no we're not getting anything else. <laughs> there's no discussion. 
things that go on. It's just organizing the board. So I do believe that can be done uh, quickly and efficiently. So I am good with moving to that. Now, I guess the only question is, and if it's just an organization meeting, I'm, I'm fine with doing it even earlier and having it separate from a regular board meeting and being earlier in September. But I do think that we need to allow the division to get up and running and going, and then we have that meeting. Craig. Could you make that a friendly amendment that the organizational meeting take place after Labor Day? Would you be willing to do that? Jenny's going to do that for you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'll make a friendly amendment that to Craig's motion. I motion that, can I, do I say I motion? I move. I move that the board hold, hold a organizational meeting in the first, well, early following the September long weekend. In the week following, it depends. It could be the Tuesday following Labor Day. On um, Labor Day is always the Monday. Yeah, like the day, oh. Let's do Thursday it's following Thursday Labor Day. Oh, okay. Well, the second one to do the second Tuesday of the month. That could be the day after Labor Day. I would say the Tuesday. Like the very next day after Labor Day weekend. Yeah, I Not the first day of school. Let's do the Thursday. How are Thursdays for people? No? You don't like Thursdays? Fridays? What day of the week does everyone like? And then I'll make an amendment. Sorry, Leanne. How about that it'll be held within the first two weeks of September? It, okay. It would be nice to know what day it is, but okay. I move that the board hold an organizational meeting in the first two weeks of September. Oh, sorry, Leanne. We're still working on Can things. I make an amendment to the amendment? Go ahead. Oh, that we friendly. hold the organizational meeting prior to the first board meeting of September. That way we can we can choose as a board to hold it the day of the first board meeting because it's still prior to, or we can pick within the first two weeks as well, but it just gives flexibility um, to our board. We have the fourth. Do we always have our meetings the third or the fourth Tuesdays of the month? Usually fourth. the fourth. Fourth. It is kind of late. And that's not saying, well, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's just not nailing it down to a time, but it's saying prior to. We can still okay. do it two weeks in. Because it'd be nice for the. It'd be nice for the. Go put your mic on. Chair or vice chair or whatever to be able to prep for that meeting, right? Yeah. They should do it. Craig. Uh, I would just say that the, the the motion by Jenny is probably the most satisfactory one because we know it has to take place in the first two weeks. Uh, when you say prior, then there's always excuses or something that comes up and then all of a sudden it's the last week of September and then we're a month into school. Uh, again, Knowing that, number one, school doesn't always start the day after Labor Day. It sometimes starts before, it sometimes starts after. It depends on when Labor Day is, but having the first two weeks, then it gives us a chance to, depending on the date of Labor Day, it also allows us to have, you know, either before or after it's in September, but before Labor Day or after Labor Day, whatever, but after Labor Day, I mean, sorry, Tyler, after Labor Day. Christine, I just need clarification because Craig, when you uh, presented this motion, you asked for organizational meeting to be pushed back. And then you also stated that we have a two month gap of information and you want information. Are you expecting this information at this organizational meeting? Because I think I'd like to clarify that it's organizational only. It's only organizational meeting. The next motion will discuss that one. Thank you. So knowing that it's a Craig's original motion and Jenny made a friendly amendment, I'm not hearing that Craig is in agreement with the friendly amendment from Christine. Is that correct? Okay. She attempted to. Okay, Tyler. Can we just have the motion read back? Yes. Please. Yep. With the friendly amend with Jenny's friendly amendment.
Jenny's, Jenny's needs to also have the part about election, though. Except in the air of an election. That part still needs yep. to be there, and then I'm good. Okay, any further comments? Seeing none, those in favor? And Christina, that was kind of, I could barely see it. Yeah, okay, good. Sounds good. So that's carried. And yes, yeah, sorry, Christina. Next is 204.2 regular board meetings, Craig. Again, um, it's just, I feel uncomfortable when we have a last meeting in June and we don't have another meeting till the end of September. Uh, a lot can happen government-wise, politic, I mean, that, in, that affects the board governance, affects the operation of a school division. And if we wait till the end of September, then it just does make us, maybe some complications arise. Uh, I would feel comfortable if we had it at the same time as the organizational meeting, but, and, and it, that one doesn't have to be quick, just to update on everything. And I'm pretty sure that, uh, I, and when I thought about this one, I don't want a meeting more than an hour anyway, but it just allows us to get caught up with what's happening and, and uh, stuff. And so I leave it up to the rest of the board to decide whether they want to do that or if they just want to stay with the, organizational meeting and then the board meeting in the end of September. Questions or comments? Tyler. Yeah, I'm very much in disagreement with this one. Um, again, I re realizing now too that uh, when it was worded before is August, which I said, that's just terrible time, I think, to be trying to get together, especially to do uh, business and whatnot. Things are pretty slow during uh, July and August, and we need to allow um, our executive council to get up and running, know what's going on, know where there may be issues, know where there's what's going on before we have that meeting. So I, I don't want to burden them anymore. Um, again, I, I don't think there's, I think it's confusing to the public to start to put two meetings into September when we generally meet on the fourth Tuesday of every month. So I, I don't want to throw an, a strange meeting in at the start of September for our benefit. I don't think we're missing anything by waiting till then. This board uh, does have a history. If there's anything emergent that comes up, we've met in July and August before. If there's something that is truly urgent that comes up or things that we need to do, we will meet. Uh, we will call a meeting. Um, so I'm not at all worried about that. I would like to see us. I'm good with the uh, organizational meeting early because it has sound reasoning why uh, to put that there. I don't see that with this one, so I do not want to change from the regular board meeting starting fourth Tuesday of September. Other comments? My only comment is that I um, I would assume that um, as executive council, you'll provide us with different updates as you do now already. So like if there's any staffing thing that we needed to know that was huge, you would certainly um, communicate that out to us. In, in an email as as you do typically already. So um, that would be my assumption that I'm going to make is that executive council is going to keep, keep us updated um, between June and September's meetings. So um, for me, I think yes, at least having that organizational meeting is really important. And at this point, I'd be fine to not have an earlier meeting in September. Other comments? Well, I'll just okay. make the motion and then see how a vote goes. I move that we have uh, a regular board meeting after our organizational meeting in the first two weeks of September. Okay, any questions, comments? Seeing none, those in favor? Those opposed? And that's defeated. Thank you, and moving on, next is 8.8 .8 ad, ad hoc committee regarding policies. Again, this was uh, carried over from April. Um, in our discussion in April, we did see that there were a lot of policies that uh, should be procedures and some procedures that maybe should be policies. Uh, you've seen the rationale for this, so, and, um, I think uh, I would say I would like to make a motion to create an ad hoc committee consisting of 
board chair as ex officio member, the policy chair and one additional trans trustee for the purpose of hiring an outside consultant to help us with the development and revision of our policies. Now, I would add this, and I'm not sure where to put it. Um, that the outside consultant would also go through um, the different ways of policies and procedures that are developed in a school board so that we might have period and then talking about that so that we have an understanding of the different types of policies we have one in our division other divisions have different but to be able to fully understand it as cheryl pointed out is that we need someone to talk to us about it and that would be fine as part of my motion is the ad hoc committee would find somebody that could come in and uh, talk to us about the different ways of doing policy and procedures before we go on and develop and revise our policies. Okay. And um, so that motion is on the floor. Just one piece has there been consideration given to having the superintendent as part of that committee. Oh, yes, sorry. Okay, so can you just amend your Yes, motion? I'll amend it that uh, the uh, superintendent or delegate because in case you can't make it is that that's fine yeah okay and that you had added that board chair is ex officio right? right okay sounds good so tyler just a quick comment on the other part along other part i think that doesn't need to be in the motion i think they when they ad hoc committee comes together that can be the discussion and direction that the committee does so i don't think as long as there's an understanding of that i think you're good i don't that's, think that's I don't think fine then we that can as far as the scratch goes. that out and just do with the original one with just adding the superintendent or designate yeah and that board chair is ex officio yeah, perfect i am and apart from that, I guess I'll make comments that, boy, this one's iffy for me. I don't know. It's just such a big task that I, <laughs> there's so much going on just coming out of COVID. Uh, I don't know. That's I, I agree that there should be some review of some policies and whatnot. So I don't know. Okay, great. And I, this is, I, I don't expect to, to do it in one month or two months. It might take the whole year. And because anytime... For instance, if we decide to change our format, any policy developed by the board has to go out to stakeholders. It has to be reviewed by everybody, and then it comes back. So I'm not I'm not anticipating that we would sit there and slog through it in two months. I'm I'm looking at a whole year, maybe a year and a half before we get the final product. Other questions, Jenny? Um, I do think the policies do need to be consolidated and made manageable. And I think that we're spending time in every meeting um, going through them, like we're maintaining these policies. And so I'm not sure how the third party advisory piece works, but my hope is that that will alleviate some of the work for the board by having a party there. Um, I do see the need for this, so I support that. Craig? Commenting on that, um, Westwinds hired an outside consultant, and uh, it worked very well, and he was able to uh, trim their policies down to about 24, 26. I can't remember. I went on and looked at it, and it's in the document here somewhere. But... Uh, they just help focus the board on where to go with the policy and making sure it's board governance. And uh, if a policy isn't part of board governance and it's taken out and then it's put into uh, some sort of procedure that falls under a policy. Okay, I'm not, or Christina, go ahead, Christina.
Craig? It's not about cutting policies. It's about putting policies in their rightful place. Uh, a number of those things that we pass today are really procedures. They're not policies. And so you have a breadth of a policy that takes care of all of those, and then the procedures have to fit the policy. So uh, I don't see a problem in that uh, what we're trying to do is make board governance manageable and that it allows the administration to develop procedures that help us in guiding the, the policies. And so it's not like we're going to get rid of a bunch of stuff. We're just reassigning them. And, and that's taken, that will be a board decision on how to do it with, in concert with the uh, superintendent or designate and uh, our consultant. It's, it's a very open process and it'll work. Uh, and I think uh, other boards have done it and it's been quite good. And they managed very well to focus on the governance and procedures fit the governance. So uh, it's not like we're getting rid of them. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Christine. Can I make a recommendation that before you hire the consultant, you get their CV and and also get references from other school boards just to make sure that the intended result that they had after a couple of years was what they wanted, just so that you have that when you get a couple consultants and make sure you're comparing them. Craig? Uh, I, I thought that was understood. But yes, thank you for the, thank you. It would go through a process where we would ask people, we would ask two or three people to submit their CV and their experience with dealing with it and uh, what they can bring, plus a couple of, uh, and then some uh, comments from other boards that have dealt with them. So yes, that, that would be part of the whole process. Tyler. I'd assume with the consultant and the period of time this is going to take, this is actually going to be, have a substantial cost to it. Do we need to, Christine, this is for Christine Lee, do we need to say where the funding for this is going to come from? Do we need to outline and say, you know, how we're going to fund this? Any suggestions on <laughs> where we might say that we are taking money from of the budget? In well, order right to now the only place you have is for reserves. Okay. Is everything spent? Christine? Do we have an idea of what this process would cost you in speaking with other boards who've gone through this process? Are you aware of that? I'm aware of a, a low figure and a high figure. Uh, one figure was ten to $15,000. Another one was $50,000. Uh, I would assume that uh, if we get the right person, that we could probably do it for that fifteen to 50, ten to fifteen thousand, and that it, or slightly higher. But I, I would not personally spend fifty to sixty thousand dollars to change our policies. I think it can be done cheaper, and that would be one of the proposals that would have to come to us. And um, like anything else, the committee would make a a recommendation, and then the board would vote on it because it has something to do with money. So we won't be doing it without board approval. Okay. Jenny? Is there any funding in the board budget? Board's budget? Uh, there is a consultant line, so it depends. Um, I can't remember what's how much, sorry. I don't have the number in front of me. I don't know much is in it, but there is a consultant line would pay for some of that if you're not using like a consultant to do other stuff, depending. Yeah, but I don't know if it has that much in it. So, but I think what you, you do is you, I think the time to worry about where you find the money is when, when you bring back your recommendation. And then at that point, if you're going to hire a consultant, then that's when you'll make the motion where it's come from. And if it's not in the consultant line, you have reserves. So for me, when I look at the motion, so it's based on what was written, right, with those minor adjustments, um, it does say for the purpose of hiring. So I would like to see an amendment made that it would be that the committee would bring back the information on 
on the somebody help me out but right now to me this says that the committee is being formed for the purpose of hiring right not to bring it back to the board so investigating process cost correct that, that's what you're yes. looking for so help me process change. Making a recommendation to the board. Why did you say for, for making a recommendation to hire? Perfect. Are you good with that, Leanne? I'm about to say engage. Yeah, just, yeah, got Trustee Allison for spell amendment that the committee investigate process and cost for making a recommendation to hire. Yeah, how about instead engage a consultant for the purposes of policy review? Yeah. I, I would take that as all friendly amendments. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, for the purpose of bringing information back to the board for the hiring of an outside consultant to help us with the development revision of our policies, because that's really what you want, is that it comes back to the board. We could, we'll make a recommendation and then the board will decide if we want to go ahead with that. So, correct. That's what I, you. That's correct. what you wanted. I do not want to decide today that we are going to hire. Oh, oh no. So no. I wanted to state that. Oh, Christina's. Um, she fell asleep and hit the wrong button. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be a friendly amendment. Taking what you want, and if so, that we do it. Yep. And I do agree with what I've heard from others in terms of. Yes, we need to look at this, but timing we really we do have a lot so um i don't want this to be that it's everything at once that it's like in june you're bringing it back and we're going ahead with it i think it needs to be thought out process and us actually looking at this i i would say that uh, based on the time of the year you're probably looking at september october before we will even look at who we would like and bring it back to the board. So Perfect. it's not like it's going to happen okay. right away. Okay. I'm good then. Christina, I don't know if you heard, we just made an amendment. Okay. So we made an amendment so that it's instead of the intent being for the purpose of hiring an outside consultant, the purpose is that the committee would look at uh, um, an option and bring that back to the board for us then to look at as a board. So we're not saying that the motion today is not that we're gonna hire the board, the consultant, it's that they're gonna bring it back and then there'll be a delay in that, that it would be this fall that before we would see anything back. So, okay, any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. Those in favor? And that's carried. All right. So next is 8.9 school liaisons 2022-23. And that is Cheryl. Okay. I guess my concern on this one, I know maybe in the past that's how it was done, but uh, choosing a school for liaison, I think, is a board governance thing because we want to go to a certain school. And uh, personally, after only whatever, December, January, March, April, May, June, eight months, I do not feel like I've got to know uh, my schools that well to switch and go to another school. And I think that part of, part of our job as trustees is building relationships. And when you're only allowed one year to school, that doesn't help with a lot of relationships. Personally, I'd like to stay with the three schools that I have. Um, and I think that this could be done at the organizational meeting that uh, we have enough time to think and we decide which schools we would like to go to. And, and that's the only reason I brought it up for as an action item because under the other one, it's just that we receive this and it's already done. So I, I just feel more comfortable if the board decided where they'd like to go. 
And I know that's contrary to what's happened in previous boards, but we do have a new board and that's the reason I say that. Any questions or comments? Jenny? Um, I'll just make the comment. I wouldn't mind staying with the same schools for like two years maybe. Like I wouldn't mind getting to know other schools as well though. But I, I can see a benefit in um, some consistency because it takes some time, especially because we don't always get to go to their events, you know, when we don't get to go to their meetings and things. It takes some time to really build those relationships. Um, and maybe that's, you know, being a new trustee, that takes more time too. Um, but I could see benefit in um, consistency through two years, but I would, I would like to also have opportunity to get to know other schools and administrations as well. Craig? Since it's an action item, I would move that the school liaisons for 2022-2023 be decided at the board organizational meeting in September. Okay, Tyler. Uh, personally, I really like the way it's done now. Um, I think it's important for trustees to be seen by as many different schools as possible. I think this is one of the best ways that we do that. Um, Often trustees don't go to schools they're not assigned to just because of time and everything else. So even if, even the way it's done now when you get your three or sometimes in rare occasions four schools that you're going through, um, it takes you two terms as a trustee to get to all the schools. So if you start knocking that down, um, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily serve two terms. Some only serve one. Some, so I think it's important and I think it's, I think it's beneficial for everyone to have that diversity and see the different schools and see the different cultures. And it's a, it's, I find it far better to get to know um, the division in general and get to see the different schools and meet the different administrators and see the different kids and see the different programs and the, and the different events that go on in every school. Um, so that's, that's one part. The other part is I don't think that we should choose our schools. Um, I think, again, it's very important for us to rotate that through. And just because three of us want to be at LCI and we all want it, want it, what, that doesn't give someone else an opportunity to be able to experience LCI or whatever the case may be, or to experience a high school grad. That's why part of the reason we move it forward is because, um, like this year, I didn't have any high school. So I, and that's great because I've been here, done that, whatever. But high school grad is a really important thing for some trustees and some people that really want to see and yes you can go and everything else but it's also different um lots of times the liaison trustee becomes part of the the ceremony that happens and says some words and does different things depending on what's going on so um that and i guess i would say i always feel sad for the the schools that get me as trustee because i think they're always hoping they're right they're waiting for the next year when they can get a different trustee to come out <laughs> They're like, no, that, so that, I think a few schools would be pretty sad, Craig, if you said, hey, we're giving you Tyler again this year. They'd be like, oh, man, I thought I was getting someone else. So anyways, those are the reasons I really like the rotation of it. And it's I really enjoy it, getting to different places and different sections of the city and seeing all the different people, different kids, different cultures. Craig. Well, I think you, you do have some good points. Um, what I look at is that maybe one of us would like to do four schools instead of the same person doing four schools. The other thing is, is that we should do in September or first part of October is a board visit to every school. That does as much as anything else as far as finding out what the schools are like. I've taken it on myself to visit a few schools outside of my liaison schools and have quite enjoyed it and they've enjoyed taking me around and showing me the school um, for instance I'll just give this as an example uh, I drop into Victoria Park on a regular basis and last week uh, I had a wonderful conversation with two students that were engaging and friendly and I did have to warn them that I wasn't just an old man walking around the hall I was actually a trustee <laughs> anyway I just think that, uh, well, they did look at me a little strange until I said that, but um, I think that uh, by visiting all the schools at the start of the year as a, as a group of trustees, 
or dividing us up and doing it two tours so we can get to, through all the schools. Uh, then it allows us to decide whether we want to keep our schools or change. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you can probably find some other schools to go to and we won't force you to stay with the schools you have. Uh, but I just, I just really feel that it's a board responsibility. Christine. Thank you. Craig, I think um, you gave a perfect explanation right now of of the fact that you can still engage with schools that aren't on your list, right? And there is, I echo what Tyler said, I think there's, um, and this opinion isn't coming from, it's been done this way and so therefore I'm digging my heels in, that's not it. But I've seen and experienced the benefit of being able to shift every year and know um, even in four years, you're not gonna fully have that, uh, as deep of a relationship with the school as maybe you, you desire already right now. Um, I know, I've really appreciated experiencing the diversity of our school community families and seeing how each building is its own community and has its own culture and and understanding the demographics around our city. And so um, I do support switching every year for, for that benefit. And I'm still able to engage relationship and, and, and connect with old schools and say, hey, when this happens again, for sure send an invite out to me because I'd like to, to take part in that. We can still, those doors don't close, they aren't closed. Um, and I'm also okay with the structure of um, the administrator creating this list. I think when they, my understanding is when they create this list, um, they make sure that we do have different experiences in the different divisions or in the different, um, yeah, in the different divisions, Div 1, Div 2, right? Elementary, um, middle, and high. And so it's good to get um, a spectrum of ex experience in all of the schools. Craig? In response to that, I'm not saying that we wouldn't. I think the key that I look at is this is just a board responsibility. We might decide that we all want to go to different schools, but it's a board responsibility. It's a governance responsibility. And I know that's, and I, again, that's different than what's happened over the last whatever, how many years, but I just feel that uh, if we're going to be liaisons, that we have a chance to talk about it as a board and decide. And it may well may be that after looking at it, I might take the three that have been given to me, or I might would like to take two and keep one back and say the same. So I'm not arguing about change or anything. It's just, is this a board responsibility or is this an admin responsibility? I think it's a board responsibility because of our governance. And so that's really the issue. I, I don't care about whether the board, as a group of individuals, we can say, well, I'd like to not do this school and uh, how would you like to do it? And yeah, that's, that's, this is, uh, and I don't want to bring up a prior, but we had to make that decision with our Christian schools and our Muslim schools up in Calgary every year. And it was a good conversation and people changed and people did it, but at least the board was making the decision. Tyler and then Christine. I'm just a little confused by what you're saying, but I think I get it. So you you basically don't want administration to give us a list of schools and who's assigned where. Is that what, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that that should be a board decision. Okay, well, just so you know that it prior was a board decision. Um, we had this talk on a prior board that, hey, we want to make sure we get out to um, as many schools we can. We don't want to end up doubling up on this school. We want to make sure. So basically we, as a board, the board directed administration to create a schedule where we could be rotated through fairly and evenly in uh, the schools that we got. So just kind of like Christine said, so that, you know, if I have a high school this year, I may not have one next year. I might have a middle school. I'm now elementary. So that every trustee got the opportunity to experience that. So that's what this is. This is the manifestation of the board requesting this be done. Um, as you, I believe you should know, I think you maybe even switch for a school at the start of the year. No, no matter what, this is not 
this is not a document in stone. Even at the start of this year with the new board, I know some people came and said, oh, hey, I'd really like to be at, you know, Fleetwood Bodden this year or whatever it is. Um, so can I take that one? I was like, yep, yeah, no problem. So trustees absolutely can switch and do things. And if you want four schools instead of three and somebody's got four and says, yeah, great, three, it doesn't matter. It's, this is not, all this is is, is kind of like a starting template so we don't have to sit down for two hours and say, okay, who wants Fleetwood? Who wants Coal Banks? That's all. So that's all this is. So I, for me, this is great because the majority of the work is done. I know that I'm getting different schools than I had last time. I know that I'm getting schools I haven't had for a few years. So it, for me, it's great. In, in response to that, and I appreciate your comments. Um, if, if the board chooses to do something like this, then that's fine. But I just look at, this is a new board. We have four new trucks five new trustees. And so the, the comment is, as a board, do we decide to keep it like this or do we change it and make it as part of our organization? That's, that's the bottom line. And it's just reasserting our governance. And as you said, previous boards decided to turn that over. That's a governance decision they turned over to the administration. We haven't done that as a board. So because it was done previous, that doesn't mean that this board has to do it. And so that's that's the real intent of this is as a board, what are we going to decide to do as far as school liaisons? If the majority of the board votes to have the admin pick us out and then we have a chance to say yes or no and change, that's fine. If the majority of the board says, let's wait till our organizational meeting and do this, that's that's all I'm saying is that we have a new board. I think I get you. So what you're saying is you just want this to be a decision made at the organizational meeting as to who goes where. Okay, yeah, I'm fine with that. I, I'm fine with putting it as part of the organizational meeting. All I'm saying is I hope that I still want to get this as a starting point for where we start, just because I don't want the seven of us to be sitting around trying to figure out who gets what school. So for me, this is fantastic as a starting point. And then, yeah, we take it to the organization meeting. We discuss if we want to make any changes and then adopt it in our organization meeting. I'm good with it. Yeah, and, and I'm not, a, like I say, just let's vote to say we want this chart to go forward to the organizational meeting. And then if, not, if we need to, we'll make changes to it. Earl. Just in terms of comments, in terms of timing, um, if you wait until the board organizational meeting, um, the reason we put liaisons out now is because some invitations will already start to come to liaisons um, be, uh, for, for example, the first school council meetings and things like that that happened early in September. So just as a note, um, that one of the reasons the previous board had decided that this go out at this time of year is because liaisons do get start to get some of the information from schools in June. Christine? I was actually just gonna to speak to the final point of Tyler that it's not set in stone and typically in the fall we can switch around. That's all I was gonna say. Okay, seeing no further comment, did you have any? Well, I, I we've kind of got off. I just, um, what was my motion, Leanne? I would like to amend that to say, as per the outline given, and that changes can be made. And I think that satisfies both Christine and Tyler's concerns, and it also satisfies my concern that the board should vote on it. The motion is that the school liaisons for 2022-2023 be decided at the board organizational meeting in September as per the outline given and changes can be made. You said that the organizational meeting, right? Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Any for no further? We're good. Okay. Those in favor? Those opposed? I'm like, yeah. Andrea, can you show again you were in favor? Those in favor? No, Andrea is not, does not have her hand down. Okay. Okay, and then those opposed? For me, I'd still like to have some time, but I think given that we would want our schools the information um like i'm not certainly not prepared tonight like i know that we did do a lot of moving around when we were given the list last time and to not know like what night these are even meeting or anything so to me i don't know if we even just bring it back to the june meeting and then it can still go out to school councils that motion failed yeah okay uh, so Craig and then Christine and Tyler. No, you're good. Well, I would I would move that we just um, um, revisit uh, that decision in um, June, with the understanding that we would have times of all their school councils, like the date we. I, I guess to talk to that, we've had board meetings where school councils have met. And it obviously there needs to be some more communication to school councils that you cannot meet on a, uh, on a board date because then we're, we're, none of us can go. But if you, well, you can make, if you wanna make the motion too, I just think maybe we should, yeah, I don't mind looking at it again, but in June. And I think that um, to me, it's based on kind of, some school councils will have decided what their dates are next year some won't so it's to me it's more just looking at what history has been and if they have made a decision then we might have some more information i just haven't had a chance to look but um, i'm happy with the list the way it is i think that we should though make sure that if we're going to make some juggles like i know that jenny's not available on wednesdays or that may change depending on what happens with her young women's group, right? So um, just depending on those things, I think just us allow, having some time, and I know that histor historically it's been always done in May, but um, that's, for me, I think that I wanna go and take a look and make sure that we give a good representation of what we'll most likely be doing in the fall. Tyler. I just think we can absolutely still, like I think it's good that we get the list out, we get organized, because I don't think there's gonna be 28 changes on it. So I think it's good to get it out and do that. And if somebody needs to make a change because they're not available Wednesdays and school council meets Wednesday, that we make that change in September, prove it that way. I think that's good. My only other comment on telling a parent council when they can have their meeting is, am I wrong to say that the parent council meetings are the parent council and it, we're, they're, we're there at their pleasure because they invite us. And if they choose not to invite us, that's their business? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And and sometimes it's us providing. Sometimes it's us providing suggestions, or even uh, we've had from community engagement committee has brought forward and you know suggested that you know the middle school doesn't have it on the same yeah. day as the feeder high school, right? So yeah, I, I, I think it's wanted, a suggestion versus a yeah, don't have it. I just want to clarify it. that it's not it's not my right to no. go to a parent council meeting, right? No. Okay. As a trustee. Yeah. But, okay. So. So um, I don't know if I, I would like to motion that we uh, table this school liaisons to our June meeting and at that time we approve it. That was defeated to organizational meeting. I had a brand new motion. But it was moved to an action item.
correct. So I had started to make a motion that the school liaisons for the 2022-2023 uh, list be brought forward to the June meeting, uh, board meeting for approval by the board. Craig is wanting it to be a governance. A questions, comments, Christine? I guess my question is, if we're still able to make changes come September, why do we, just help, I just don't understand why, why does this need to be decided on in in June, because I think this has already taken up quite a bit of time of conversation, and I'm not saying it's not valuable conversation. Um, but if we, if Cheryl's able to send this list out, and in September we decide, okay, let's make four shifts, that's not going to be a seismic shift to our schools. It's not going to be a, a change that is going to make a school feel slighted. So I guess I'm just trying to understand why this needs to be a continuing action item because if we are still able to engage it in September and still able to make changes it in September, how is it not a board governance responsibility? So what, when the mo first motion was on the floor, your comments were um, out of respect to our schools and those that want to invite us to things, um, we would let them know before the end of this school year. So that is why I did not vote in favor of the original motion for it to come to the organizational meeting. So to me, this still respects our schools and allows our trustees to go home and take a look at the dates that we know of at this point and come back and still be able to give something to our school councils this school year. So for me, that's why it's different than us doing it at the organizational meeting. If we, obviously there's still maybe one or two changes after that point, but I think that um, we'll have a good idea what's going to happen for each of us for the fall and we can um, make those changes up before our next meeting. Tyler. I don't see why we would bring this back in June where we'd be in any different position than we are now, especially to vote on it. Because if you bring it forward as a motion and you vote on this list as is, that's the list. Once, once we approve it as a board, that's the list. So to make changes come some other time, now you've got to bring it forward with a motion again to change something that you already approved. So that doesn't make any sense to me why we would put it in as a motion until September. So I would I would say everything's fine as is. We don't need to bring it back. And then you can you can look, you can do whatever you want to do to see where your schools land and your days land, but the changes would be made in September. And then if we want to make this a board decision and adopt it as as a decision, someone would make a motion then in September to approve the list. So I don't understand why at at a future meeting, we can't make a decision again. I'm not under, I'm not following what you're saying in that we couldn't make another decision to change it. Well, what I'm saying is once you approve the list, that's the list as approved. It so can then, always be a change. Well, you can bring it forward again as a motion, but boy, yeah. that seems, I don't understand why we would approve something that we're just going to change. It doesn't make any sense because we don't need okay. to because we don't need to approve it until September when we know this is how it's going to be. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments or questions? Okay. And I'm totally fine to rescind it if nobody is interested in this, so I can rescind that motion and this just would then sit for information. Okay, so we're looking at uh, going for a vote. So those in favor? And those opposed? And Andrea, let's do it again. Those in favor of us deciding at the June meeting? And those opposed? <laughs> okay, and that's defeated. Okay, so this report is being received as information. Thank you. I'll go back.
Uh, yep, so this was approved as information so it can be sent out. So next we have division highlights. So one thing I'd like to remind people when we go through division highlights is that these are highlights. So we're not going to go through everything that you've um, done over the last month. Let's just keep it to some highlights and not tell us. You, I know that you guys have all gone to some amazing school council meetings, and everything else, but let's uh, just keep these nice and, and quick and recognize some amazing things in our division. So Craig would like to go first. I attended the 50th anniversary I'm not sure why it's the 50th anniversary. I thought the school was there a lot longer, but it might be a mal amalgamation of the two. So I attended the 50th anniversary of Fleetwood Bodden, uh, had an enjoyable time, lots of parents, and uh, had a good conversation. And that's probably my biggest highlight of the month. Excellent, Christine. I was able to attend Red Dress Day at Victoria Park and help serve tacos to the staff and students. Um, it was a really great lunchtime event to um, shed light on the significant issue of um, harm and violence to Indigenous women, um, both within our community and outside of our community. I was also able to attend in person at SAG, the Arts Live and Well in School, Gala, and it was really exciting to be able to be there in person and to see the students receive their um, awards in person. And finally, Trusty Light's puppy tour continued this month, and I was able to spend a day at LCI, and it was really, it was so much fun. And I think, honestly, the most rewarding thing was hearing students say, this has made me feels so good today. This is the best part of my month. My wellness totally skyrocketed. And to have um, school counselors um, point me to a student and say, that student never smiles. And they had the biggest smile. So for me, that's worth it. Awesome. Thank you. Jenny. I heard positive feedback about Trusty Light's puppy tour at LCI as well when I attended parent council. So good job. Um, highlights for me has just been um, being able to be involved in some of the ongoing extracurricular things at different schools, the plays and performances and the sports and the galas and things that are that we're able to see our students kind of um, showcase some of the things they've been working on and their skills and their talents and mostly just the energy that we feel being there and and the energy coming from the students and from um, the, the parents and the whole school community. So I, in the interest of time, will leave it vague. Sounds good. Uh, Christina. Thank you. And Andrea.
<laughs> we know you did. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. And Ooh. awesome. And Tyler. That's why I wait to go after Andrea every time because she covers it all. So I don't have to Perfect. say much more. But the, yeah, the rap program turnout. Wow, that was incredible. Yeah. What they got going on there is something to see. Yeah. And that was going to be my highlight as well was the wrapping off campus coordinator presentation. There was over 160 people. It was absolutely amazing to connect with so many students and parents and just have conversation about what's happening for their students and what opportunities exist within our division. So it was just fabulous to be able to have that opportunity and to be able to share what we are doing. So that was fabulous. Next, we'll move on to the community conversations. So our community conversations was last Thursday on May 19th, the entire week said 100% rain, 100% rain, 100% rain. And with Lethbridge forecast, you never know it's going to change and so we left it to as long as we could and then made the decision we needed to do something different um, so we offered up the virtual opportunity to still meet with us as trustees and there was quite a number of us on that and we did have a few parents that joined us and they were parents that have not engaged with us in in other ways previously or engaged in other ways in terms of they haven't been to school council or anything so it was great to have those opportunities um, and I'll ask for input from people and then we'll go over to the June event. So those that were in attendance, thoughts, comments? I really enjoyed the comments from the one lady that we never saw, but she, I guess, logged it in. And the gentleman that, uh, whose son goes to the Spanish immersion program, I was a little confused whether he lived in Colehurst or Lethbridge, but his son goes to Colebanks. So, no, it was a great conversation. Good. Any other comments? Christine? I thought it was really good. Um, really good conversation. Um, the parents had some really great input and both were very encouraged with things happening in our division. I do need to speak to something. Um, that I felt was unfortunate. Um, in, in the midst of our of our conversation, I I turned my camera off, and when I turned my camera off, a trustee started speaking, and it, it was really great, positive conversation with the parents. And the parents were sharing about all the great things our division had, which I think is really the purpose of community conversations. That's really what we want. We want to hear the successes and celebrations. Um, a trustee just chose to say that the previous board did not uh, value parent uh, participation, parent voice. And this was said on a couple of times. And I was, I was disheartened by this statement. And the reason why I was disheartened by this statement was, one, it was a really great, positive conversation. So I didn't know why a trustee chose to put a negative spin on the conversation because I felt in doing so, two sitting board members were disparaged. And two sitting board members were disparaged um, with false claim. Because I have to say, having sat on the previous board, I did and I do value parent perspective. Is there room for improvement on systems? Absolutely. And there will be room for improvement on systems with this sitting board as well. There's always going to be room. But the previous board had the community engagement committee. We hosted town hall. Um, we attended school council meetings. Um, the previous board launched the community engagement website because we valued community connection and we wanted to ensure, we saw gaps and we wanted to ensure that those gaps were minimized and we wanted to deepen connection with community. And that, those things weren't shared. And when I look at who we are as a board and how we need to engage with each other, represent each other as a board body in our, in policy 202.1, 
trustee code of conduct, we're mandated by policy to act in a spirit of harmony and teamwork. And I think to disparage board members in such a way isn't appropriate. And it's not building a, a community of propelling forward in, in a positive spirit. And so I just needed to share that. It was, it was unfortunate because I think it was such a great conversation. And, and the parents we were speaking with um, had really great insights. And I was really excited about that, um, but disappointed at that, those comments. Other comments? Okay, thank you for your feedback on that. Um, and then let's move into the June event. So Jenny was, oh, go ahead. Yes, so Jenny is has planned our June event. So I'll turn it over to Jenny to let us know where our next adventure for Community Conversations is gonna be. So we were disappointed that we couldn't be in person at the playground due to weather um so we're going to go back to the same venue and try try again so we'll be at the Qantas uh shelter which is the north side of Henderson it's gonna repark but the shelter itself has a sign that says Qantas I think as far as I can tell on the city website it's booking it it's the Qantas So how about you work together with Garrett tomorrow just to confirm the We're going to be one closest to the playground. Yeah. By the bug park, by the cannons. <laughs> so the northeast corner of Henderson Lake, there's a playground, there's a shelter there. We're going to be there. Maybe that's why there's confusion of whether you can book it or not. Two playgrounds. There's two. I know, okay, I know. so let's leave this part to decide tomorrow. and Let's go ahead with the date and... Monday, June 13th from 10 to noon. Perfect. No, and 10 then to 11.30. 10 to 11.30. 10 to 11.30. Monday, June 13th. Excellent. Thank you. Hope you can all make and, it. And uh, Garrett will work together with Jenny tomorrow to confirm that date and post that on our Facebook and send that out. So, okay. Perfect. We will get that organized and ready for our June uh, community conversations. Thank you. And next we have board funding support to school councils. And this um, outlines the way that the board provides um, funding to our school councils. And that is outlined there for your information. So when you're asked at a school council meeting, um, you have that clearly there for you, including the $250 for um, support for parent engagement strategies at their school council. And the re membership renewal for ASCA that will be um, paid before the end of, or maybe it's already been paid. Okay, yep. Yeah. So, so that you have that information that is there for you for when you are at school councils and you're asked, that clarity is provided to you. And next is the Canadian School Boards Association uh, Congress is coming up July 6th to the 8th. Everybody was provided with information for that. And it's there for you for information. If you do plan to attend, Leanne can help in any way necessary, but you will be needing to register yourself for that um, event. Are there people that are looking at going? I know, Craig, you were thinking of it. I was until my wife booked a holiday in Idaho that week. <laughs> and so now you're not going? Okay, sounds good. And I'm potentially going, but haven't uh, confirmed anything at this point. So. Okay. And next is post-COVID community building, and this is Jenny. Oh, I think I've kind of spoke to this previously uh, during Cheryl's report. Um, just with the transition and just I spoke to just the communication piece with parents at the elementary school levels and just I feel like I've covered my point on this one. Um, Craig? Yeah, and I think we all got an email from some concerning uh, access, but if you look at 
and I'll use the examples of what I know, Livingston Range, Palliser, Lethbridge Public, probably Holy Spirit too, elementary schools are not open. And parents do not get to come in and go down to the classroom of their child. That's That's been, as long as I was a teacher in an elementary school, you just avoid a lot of problems. So parents have to understand it isn't post-COVID, it's, it's before COVID that was happening, I hope, and that you're, you're allowed to go to the office and then they'll call your child down. That I think it's, I don't know why some of our parents think that they can kind of go. Maybe the principals need to just be reminded of that policy. Uh, but that's pretty standard in the province, I think, isn't it, Cheryl? I would say absolutely it's standard in the province. I um, Certainly that's the practice that I had witnessed in the divisions I was in before Lethbridge School Division. Lethbridge School Division, there was some, I would say, greater flexibility with parents um, you know, coming into the school and going to classrooms. And I think, you know, one of the lessons learned during COVID that the principals, I'll be honest, the elementary principals have said, we love it that instructional time isn't being interrupted, right? So in other words, um, if there's something to drop off for a child that it's dropped off, but and certainly a child can be called down to the office at any time if a parent needs to see their child. And 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 so for some schools, Craig, I would say it might be a bit of a change, right? Yeah. And, but I don't know for sure. I mean, I, I haven't been here long enough to know for sure, but certainly what you say is true, This that it would not be common practice for parents to go down to classrooms during instructional time. Right. And it is different for high school and middle school, right? Yes, and, and so certainly the and same as school doors being locked, that would be common practice across Canada, across this province, across North America, for school doors to be locked, front doors, and, and for parents to be... And so if parents are not feeling welcome in there, then we really need to work with our schools. Because I know some schools, the reception they may receive or the individuals who are the reception people may be more, or, you know, we maybe we need to work a little bit on that. But certainly schools have expressed and articulated school principals. I've talked to them about that, that they want parents to feel welcome. Some parents are equaling welcome to being able to go down to classrooms. And so certainly, you know, how do we create a culture where parents feel welcome. That's And that's something that our principals have talked about and that they're trying to do. How do we make people feel welcome? Um, but sort of read it, that that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to sign in or check in at the office or buzz in to get into a school or um, not just be able to go down to a classroom. So it looks different, but I think schools value and want parents engaged in the community. and. And we do, if there are parents feeling unwelcome, then we, that's actually our principals, you know, are committed to trying to address that. Jenny. I think what Cheryl is saying is bang on that really it has a lot less to do with whether or not parents ever were in schools or are now and has more to do with communication. And I think that that's just the whole point is just how are we communicating? What is that school's plan? And how are we communicating it to the parents and even to those ad administrative support staff in the office there who are maybe feeling the stress and burden of like, well, I'm supposed to feeling a little bit of this. They're the ones that have to buzz people in They're a little bit of this gatekeeper. And so just that example I gave, that was the reason I gave that example for that administrative staff, support staff to feel that, that stress of feeling like, well, okay, she has an appointment with the teacher already so I guess I'll escort her down there do you know what I mean that's not a really ideal situation for anyone in that situation and so just a communication so that people are feeling comfortable and and welcome and and that everyone's on the same page and and I think in the past there was so much parent volunteerism in schools that it would have been onerous for the secretaries to be constantly I mean I mean, you're in there doing book exchange and reading with, and you're doing, there were so many parents volunteering so many different things that for somebody to keep track of them all and say, where are you going? What are you doing? Would have really interrupted their day. And so it's just transitioning. And I think it's really comes down to what, if we're hearing from parents, then we're just recognizing a need for communication. So. No further questions or comments. So we'll move on then to reports. So joint city and school boards, and that's Christine. 
Sure. Thank you, Allison. Yep, the report is before you. Uh, it was a very brief agenda. Cheryl, Allison, and I attended our joint city meeting on the 27th of April. So city bus transportation update, um, just continuing to advocate to continue to have a seat at the table for the con continuing conversation of accessible and inclusive transportation and process. Um, ward system review, Allison asked, um, just what's going to be happening with the ward system, what the process is going to be, and what is the process for um, school divisions. So as you can see, it's a 55% to 44% yes and no uh, in a non-binding vote during the election. And so we did have brief conversation of um, is it viable to um, maintain a non-ward system? Um, should the city go to wards and what would it mean if we didn't and what would it mean if we did and so uh, just brief conversation about yes there would be added cost right now to the division should we not go to a ward if the city goes to a ward um, and so we'll continue to have that conversation as the city moves forward but good information um, gained there um, and then just a brief question on signage on buses it was asked if school buses are required to use signaling devices when stopped and so the Provincial Safety Traffic Safety Act does not allow the use of such devices. And we learned that Councillor Ryan Parker can drive a school bus. So you can just call him should we need, right? So call on him if we're short a driver. That's what I got. Craig. Uh, unless the municipality has passed the necessary bylaw. And that's, well, uh, having the stop sign out. Uh, some communities have got that. And uh, in some respects, it's a safety issue. And I can certainly attest to the fact that depending on where the bus stops on my route home, uh, I would appreciate uh, the signage because the kids ran in front of the bus in front of me and I was aware of it, but would slow down and stop, but some other people wouldn't. So it just, if we feel that's an issue, then we can approach the municipality to do that, so. Yeah, and you did have that in your minutes. Yeah, you did. Yeah, <laughs> was there. Um, if I can just add, so on your, at your tables is a chart that looks like this. So this is what we were provided from the, when they had the ward uh, system review discussion. So this um, kind of goes over what the city plan is in regards to that. And uh, you'll see the school division uh, piece to it. So as we go forward, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on what the city is doing because there are impacts for us and the steps that we would need to be taking as well. So in the next um, few months, we'll learn what the city's doing and then we can proceed from that point on the ward system. Any other questions on that? Yeah. Well, they're doing their part. If uh, if we have to do our part, then we'll get there. But um, so then, Division School Council, and that's Christine as well. Okay. The report is before you. Uh, two conversations uh, that took the most time uh, within our meeting were uh, bell time. So just clarification on that process, and then the engagement fund discussion. So really good conversation about how schools are utilizing. There's still some schools that haven't figured out how to utilize it. They now have a month left, so I hope that they um, find a really great idea and are able to move forward with that. And if you'd like to have detailed conversation, uh, see detailed conversation notes, you can find them in the minutes on the division website. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions for you. Uh, moving on to policy advisory, Christina. Perfect, thank you. I'm not seeing any questions for you on that. And then community engagement. And I know that Christine had uh, chaired that meeting, so go ahead. Sorry, thank you. Conversation on the five points uh, presented and I'll take any questions. Oh, sorry, what did I miss? It's just, I was at the meeting, so just to, just for re the record, I was I was at that meeting. Oh, you were at that meeting. Just for the record. My apologies. That's okay. Add Christine Lee to that That's meeting. That's okay. Perfect. So we'll make sure that that is added. And then we have poverty intervention, Christina.
Thank you. And I'm not seeing any questions. So thank you for all that work. And with that, we're on to uh, correspondence. So the correspondence is there. Is there any questions? Christine? I do, I do want to point out on the minister's letter back to um, the school division related to the fuel request, the fuel stabilization grant. She, they indicate the student transportation funding increased by 5% for the 2021 school year and 5% for the 2021-22 school year. Uh, in response to rising transportation costs, it did not increase in 21-22. It was a 0% increase. So I just want to let you know it was 5% when they moved to the new model because they haven't actually done a count of our actual growth. Got zero for this year, and then it's 4.66 for next year. So that, so I just want to point that out. Thank you. And then I need a motion for us to move into camera. Craig and those in favor and I can't see online sorry and Andrea are you still on with us and that's carried for us to go into camera <laughs> 